Well, I think it's time to get started. Hello, welcome. Welcome to this evening's program. Munger Hall Student and Community Response Panel. I want to thank all of you so much for taking the time, especially during Dead Week, which I know many of you are uh, in the middle of, for taking the time to join us for the presentations you're about to hear and for participating in the public comment segment later this evening. Our audience is both here in Campbell Hall and also watching via live stream today. And I'd like to remind those of you who have joined us in person that UCSB has reinstated its indoor masking requirement for events due to the uptick in COVID cases in Santa Barbara County. So to protect yourselves and those around you, please remember to wear your masks as long as you're inside Campbell Hall or in any building here at UCSB. My name is Deb Callahan. I am the chair of Campus Housing Alternatives to Munger Hall, please, better known as CHAMP. I'm a UCSB alumni. I'm an environmental studies major, class of 1981. I love this university, and I've stayed actively involved in the environmental studies department for 30 years. I was honored to be named the Environmental Studies Department's Alumnus of the Year in 1997, and it was one of my high points in my career when I was a commencement speaker for UCSB's College of Letters and Sciences graduation ceremony in 2019. Just made it before COVID started uh, bringing us all away from the campus. During my day job, I run a consultancy called North Star Strategy up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I provide strategic services to environmental nonprofits, foundations, and campaigns. And this evening, I will be your MC for this important forum on Munger Hall. I want to recognize the five sponsoring organizations of this evening's forum. UCSB's Environmental Advisory Board, the EAB, CHAMP, Santa Barbara County Action Network, SBCAN, Central Coast Green Building Council, and the American Institute of Architects, Santa Barbara Chapters Healthy Housing Committee. I want to thank all of our sponsors for helping to organize and promote this event. The range of perspectives that our sponsoring organizations represent include students, alumni, community and professional association members, and I think that the sponsors demonstrate the breadth and diversity of stakeholders who are interested in seeing a positive solution to the current shortage of appropriate housing for UCSB's student body. The university's administrators, students, and stakeholders all agree on the pressing need to build more housing for UCSB's student body. And the job at hand is to find the right solution to provide sufficient housing quickly that is affordable, sustainable, and appropriate for the students who live there, which is why we've organized this event here today, to engage in a thoughtful and informed discussion which informs a path forward that makes sense for UCSB and its student body. I think it's useful to briefly share with you the story of how this event came to be. In early April, I reached out to Professor, Professor Rita Bright after hearing that her advanced principles of environmental planning class curriculum would focus on evaluating the proposed Munger Hall student housing project. She, after we spoke, she invited me to come and speak to her class, and I came, and I talked about the role of civil society in the planning process. And after my presentation, I opened up the floor to students for discussion, and I posed a, a question to the students. What would you like to see happen regarding the Munger Hall project's planning and approval process? And one student responded, I'd like there to be an opportunity for students to participate in a public hearing on Munger Hall. The next hearing on Munger Hall will be on the environmental impact statement and is going to be held this summer when students are away from campus or have graduated. We have a lot of ideas. We have a lot of insights to offer about Munger Hall. Students will be the ones who live there after all, and it seems like the opportunities for public comment happen during the summer when students aren't on campus. I thought about it a minute. That was a really important comment. And after I thought about it, I thought, and I said, you don't have to wait 
to be invited to someone else's hearing. You can organize your own hearing and invite the administration to come to your hearing and then you can make your views known. And the Munger Hall planners and administration can come provide their perspectives and hear what you have to say and get your input. So that was a good class discussion and we talked about some more things and the next day I was on the plane and I was flying home and I was thinking about you know, the, the class that I'd spent time with, really smart students, really dedicated professor. And I thought about the hearing idea and I thought, dang, that is a good idea. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought it really made a lot of sense and that it was really important to provide students before summer break an opportunity to present their ideas about Munger Hall. Well, a couple days later, Professor Bright reached out to me to say that her class liked the hearing idea and said the students wanted to hold a hearing and invite stakeholders and decision makers to participate and give their Environmental Studies 135B class a chance to make presentations on their findings on Munger Hall. So 31 days ago, we agreed to organize this event. It was an organic idea, a genuine idea that just sort of found its legs. And the students reached out to UCSB's Environmental Advisory Board, who enthusiastically agreed to sponsor tonight's event on campus. The other sponsoring organizations are SB CAN, Central, Bo Central Coast Green Building Council, and AIA Santa Barbara's Healthy Building Committee. They've all signed on and supported this effort, and we're so grateful for all the sponsors who worked hard to make today possible. So then, once we decided to do this, we reached out to Gene Lucas immediately to ask if he'd be willing to participate and represent the Munger Hall planning team. And he agreed to come right away and be part of this event. And we truly appreciate that Gene is here to represent UCSB's administration and the project's planners and is open and interested in learning about the students' findings that you're gonna hear tonight and hearing the public comments that you all are going to also be delivering. It reminds me how this came about, of one of my favorite quotes from Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman ever elected to Congress. She once said, if they don't offer you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. And I think Campbell Hall is our folding chair. In America today, it's important to model how to engage in informed and respectful discourse that results in good policies and good decisions especially on topics that are controversial. I look forward to our presentations and discussions this evening being productive and respectful. Thank you all for your engagement and your interest. So let's get started. Today's program has three segments. First, UCSB Munger Hall Project presentation by Professor Jean Lucas. So that's the first segment is gonna be a presentation by um, the Munger Hall planners uh, and UCSB. The second segment of this program is gonna be two panels of presentations by the students of the Environmental Studies Department Advanced Principles of Environmental Planning class, ES-135B. And they have spent 10 weeks analyzing the Munger Hall project. And they're gonna make a five-part presentation on their findings and recommendations. You can see the long table. They are very organized and they're ready to share their findings with you. The third important part of this evening is a public comment period where uh, we have handed out cards. Steve Gutman already mentioned that you got two cards when you walked in the room. You have a white card and a yellow card. The white card we'd like, there are gonna be people coming down the hall collecting cards for those of you who would like to make a comment in the third portion of our evening. Hang on to that yellow card because actually We'd like to have you, after you've heard these presentations, fill out your comments. We'd like to hear kind of your before and after of, of what you've learned and, and your thoughts and views of Munger Hall, your suggestions, your ideas. So three parts. The evening's first presentation is by Professor Jean Lucas, who is representing the Munger Hall project team and is gonna give a presentation on the current status of the Munger Hall project. So I would like to introduce Professor Jean Lucas. He obtained his Doctor of Science degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1978 and subsequently joined the faculty in the College of Engineering at UCSB. 
During his tenure, he served in a variety of academic administrative capacities, spending his last 11 years as executive vice chancellor. And he retired eight years ago, but here he is. He's been serving for the past year and a half as a volunteer on the UCSB Munger Hall Project team. So thank you very much for joining us and take it away. Thank you, and thank you, Deb, for inviting me, and thank you all for coming uh, tonight. So I, I have a fairly brief uh, presentation tonight, and, and many of you I know already know about Munger Hall um, and how it's, uh, how it's designed, but I thought I'd make sure that everybody's on the same page as we get started here. So there we go. So the concept is to provide 4,500 beds to fill a long-range development plan agreement to house additional uh, enrollment of 5,000 students by the year 2025. That was the plan. Unfortunately, that additional 5,000 students uh, got enrolled several years ago, well in advance of 2025, so we're short beds. Um, the Munger Hall concept uh, emphasizes single private rooms. Um, it also emphasizes communal spaces, as we'll see, sweet studies, convivial kitchen, great room, and a number of amenities to be provided for the students that occupy uh, Munger Hall. That includes a market, a bakery, a fitness center, a plaza, reading rooms, recreation and laundry rooms, and, and more, you'll see. It also recognizes that there's limited footprints on the campus for residential housing, uh, and that uh, there's an increase in interest and use of modular construction around the world, not so much in the United States yet, and an increased need for donor funding for uh, buildings in general, and certainly for uh, in the future for residence halls. So uh, this is the site uh, for Munger Hall. It's at the intersection of, uh, of Stadium Road here, so it's Harder Stadium over on this side, and Mesa Road up here, so it's the police station and the fire station on the other side of Mesa Road. It's, it's a three-acre site. Uh, it's currently occupied by facilities management. It sits below the, the, the plateau that comprises the campus by about 20 feet, so it's surrounded by bluffs on the east and the south side here. The, uh, the, the Munger Hall project will ultimately include a bike parking area on the east and a bike parking area on the, on the south side. The north side of the building will be largely used for uh, pick up and drop off, for Uber, for Lyft, for Amazon, for UPS, uh, for Marburg. Um, so as a result of that, the, uh, the, the, of that site, it sits out here on, on the sort of the north uh, west corner of the campus. As, as the project proceeds, we will construct uh, three bicycle paths as well as uh, pedestrian sidewalks to connect the Munger Hall to the, to the campus network as a whole. Two of them will run south uh, of Munger Hall, one will run east and, and, and come by in front of, of the rec center as a whole. So I'm going to show you uh, basically three floor plans, the, the first floor and then the residential uh, uh, floors in between the first floor and the top floor. And on the, the first floor here, and it's not color coded, uh, but much of these spaces on the first floor will be occupied by support systems for the mechanical and electrical um, uh, uh, systems in the, in the building as a whole. There's a north hall, south hall that, that runs through the building um, at, at every floor. And then there's some uh, additional amenities on the first floor for students as a whole. There's a, there's a north lobby, there's a south lobby, there's a large market, there's a bakery, and then there's a number of rooms um, that provide some student services, including a theater, music practice rooms, uh, some, some tech uh, uh, centers, and a, and, a, and a viewing theater down here. The, the, the residential floors in between the first floor and the top floor all have the same layout. They're comprised of what are called houses. Here's this north-south hallway that runs here, north and south. All the houses uh, are accessed by that north-south uh, hallway. And each house uh, has, uh, there's eight of these houses on each floor, so there's four on either side of the, of the main hall, uh, hallway here. Um, each house uh, will be comprised of eight suites that are shown here, and each of the suites are comprised of eight single bedrooms and two bathrooms. And there's five bedrooms on one side of a suite study area and three, bathroom, three um, bedrooms and, a, and two bathrooms on the other side. Come back to that in just a second. At the, at the end of this uh, hallway, also called the gallery, is a great room and a game room, uh, public bathrooms, a convivial kitchen, and a laundry room. So that's true of every floor. On every floor, on, on, on every house, on every house, there'll be uh, 62 students plus a resident assistant. So this service is 63 students, this, this, uh, this common area down here at the, at the bottom. 
you can see that there, there's a bank of windows off the great room facing either east or west, depending on, on which side of the hallway you're on. And, and for, for the peripheral uh, uh, bedrooms here, there are actual operable windows associated with the, uh, with the bedrooms. But the vast majority of the bedrooms are internal and have what we'll, what's called a virtual window I'll come back to in just a second. So um, this is a closer look at, at one of these suites. So there's five bedrooms on this side, three bedrooms, two baths on this side. This is the suite study area in between. The, uh, the, the bedrooms and the bathrooms are all constructed on a precast concrete plank. Those three planks that make up the suite, the center one is for the suite study. The, uh, the one on the left and the one on the right uh, have walls uh, that have the, the electrical and the, and the mechanical uh, components embedded in them already. And we'll come back and look at, and see that these are actually manufactured off-site and brought, and, and brought to, the, to the development site in order to, uh, to stack them into a building. Um, this is a, a, a picture of a mock-up of the mock-up uh, of the suite um, in, uh, uh, in this uh, in one of these of uh, the suite study in one of these suites. And this is a picture of the mock-up of the bedroom uh, in one of the single rooms here. So there's a bed, there's the virtual window up above, there's shelving space, drawers below, closet space, and, and a desk. So the elephant in the room is the virtual window. Uh, most, as I said, most bedrooms are interior and feature a virtual window instead of a, a, a real operable window. Uh, as you look around the country, there's many high-rise apartment buildings going up in urban settings that are relying on interior bed bedrooms with no windows at all uh, because of the, the uh, high cost of the, of the property on which they're being built. Uh, these virtual windows are manufactured by Light Glass, which has been supplying these uh, virtual windows to residences and businesses and hospitals for over four years with outstanding customer satisfaction. And because they're LED based, um, you can change both the intensity and the color of the LED. And so the virtual windows in Munger Hall would be computer controlled uh, on a timer to, mi to mimic the sunrise, the day, the sunset, and the night cycle to promote uh, circadian rhythms uh, for the occupants. Again, this is a picture of the, uh, of the convivial kitchen in the mock-up. Uh, it shows a big island in the middle. There's dishwashers, microwaves, and cooktops and ovens in the convivial uh, kitchen. And this is a, a picture of the uh, great room in the mock-up. There's tables and chairs for studying and eating, and then there's, there's comfy seating uh, for, for lounging, watching TV. And there's a bank of windows here uh, in every great room. These are all uh, actual windows and, and operable. On the top floor, it's all amenities. And so there's a one acre plaza uh, on the t uh, in the middle here. This whole uh, top floor is covered with a, with a polymer sheet that's uh, translucent, lets the light in, keeps the rain out, uh, keeps the UV light, light out. And then on the perimeter of this, of this plaza um, is a, a fitness room over here on the right, a grab and go market and a juice bar here, a large recreation room, a, uh, a, a restaurant, a demonstration kitchen, reading rooms at the three corners here, um, a large classroom, and then a number of offices here for, uh, for student services as a whole. And then on the next uh, slide, you'll see some renderings of what these spaces might look like when they're finally uh, built out. So here's uh, a rendering of that, uh, of that plaza in the middle. Um, here's a rendering of the game room or the recreation room. Um, a, uh, a rendering of the classroom and a rendering of one of these reading rooms. And then as I said before, the, the, the pods that comprise these bedrooms and bathrooms will be manufactured up north. Uh, and here's an example of, uh, of one that's being manufactured in an assembly line in Woodland, California. And they're wrapped and they're mounted on flatbed trucks and be brought down to the Santa Barbara campus and actually stored temporarily at the Cabrillo Business Park site. And then they'll be trucked over to the uh, construction site and they'll be craned into position um, and, and stacked. And once they're in position, they'll be connected to the other pods electrically and mechanically. It's a, uh, it's a 40 month build for 4,500 beds uh, once this gets going. Uh, you know, when this was first uh, 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 described in the, in the, in the media, uh, Munger Hall got a pretty black eye. And there's a number of things that have been said about it uh, which, are, which are not true. Uh, and I'm just gonna list a few of them here and tell you why they're not true. So it's been described as a windowless dormitory. It's not actually windowless. There's, as I said, there's, there's 972 operable windows in this building as a whole. Uh, it was said to only have two doors. That's not true. There's two main entrances, but there's also 12 exits and they're connected to 10 stairwells in the building. So that exiting is, uh, is, is, 
is uh, quite quick if one wants to empty the building. And the modeling that's been done indicates that you can empty the entire building in 10 minutes by, by using these stairwells and exits. It's been compared to the density of Bangladesh. I don't think that's a fair comparison. Uh, probably a better comparison is the square foot per person in Munger Hall versus the other average square footage in residence halls on the campus as a whole. So Munger Hall would have 330 square feet per person because of that the large amount of, of a communal and uh, amenity space versus 150 square feet um, on average in the residence halls, and that includes the, uh, the dining commons. Um, short beds, it actually accommodates people that are up to six foot seven inch tall. We just had the men's basketball team in there to try out the beds, and they were, uh, they were quite pleased uh, with that accommodation. Um, it's been said that the donors only provided $200 million. Uh, that's not true. The donor's contribution is not yet set. Uh, Mr. Munger has been very generous with this campus as a whole and uh, basically uh, footing the bill entirely for the KIT residence hall as well as this new acquisition of the Las Barras Ranch. So that's still in discussion. Uh, that is not a number that uh, that's, uh, should be used at this point in time. And then there's the, there's, there's the, uh, the misinterpretation that students will be forced to live in Munger Hall. And Munger Hall would be a choice amongst the many uh, choices that students have in residence halls. We think that the fact that it'll be offered at 20% below market for apartments in Isla Vista, the single rooms and the amenities will be a draw for Munger Hall uh, and uh, actually will be attractive to students. Some things that the project team wants you to know and some of the by project team is, is here today. It's going to be a lead gold building that's been designed to, to, to meet the lead uh, gold standard. These, uh, the planks in the, in, the, in the floor and the ceiling uh, that are precast concrete um, will be heated and cooled uh, by circulating water uh, through the planks, um, cold during the summer, warm during the winter. And it's, uh, it's more energy efficient to heat and cool with water than it is uh, with air just because of the conductive properties of water versus air. The hot and cold water are gem generated simultaneously via heat pumps. That is, you take water, you extract heat out of it to make it cold, and you put that heat into uh, the other stream of water to heat that up. So it's quite an efficient process um, uh, compared to how we normally generate hot and cold water on campus. This is a precast concrete building. It's a huge thermal mass. Once you get it to temperature, it doesn't change uh, very quickly uh, in response to what's happening outside. And uh, again, from an energy point of view, having a very large thermal mass is a, is a very energy w efficient way of, of heating and cooling the building. It will be all electric except for gas dryers in the laundry rooms and some gas um, uh, uh, heating in the, uh, in the bakery and in the demonstration kitchen. And most of the electricity coming to campus these days is green electricity. And the access to the building, as I indicated earlier, is by foot, by bicycle, or skateboard, um, uh, um, MTD. As I fail to, to point out, there will be an MTD stop on the north side of the building, one going east, one going west, and of course, lift and Hooper as well. Uh, in terms of student well-being, uh, it's important to point out, again, single rooms. Privacy is, is important to the students that we've, we've taken uh, through the mock-up so far. But you also have 2,700 square feet of, of high-end living space uh, per house in terms of the sweet study, the convivial kitchen, and the convivial kitchen itself promotes community. Uh, in terms of ventilation, uh, 25 cubic feet per minute is pumped into all the rooms. That's uh, double the, the code requirement. That air is filtered and conditioned uh, for both temperature and, and humidity before it's, uh, um, it's brought into the, into the rooms. And it's evacuated in the suites, it's evacuated out through the uh, duct in the bathroom. And, and in the other uh, rooms, it's, it's uh, evacuated through a vertical duct as well. So there's no recirculated air in the building at all, uh, which cuts down on the, on the risk of, of, of airborne pa uh, pathogens. As I indicated before, uh, the rooms are hydronically heated and cooled and there is some local control uh, for students in their own uh, private bedrooms. Uh, the virtual windows, as I indicated, are on a circadian uh, rhythm because of their LED paste. And in terms of fire protection, uh, it's a precast concrete building. The precast concrete is not combustible. Um, it's fully sprinklered, so all the rooms are sprinklered. Um, it's a, a fire and smoke protected retreats throughout the building um, uh, that's achieved via uh, membranes and fire stop. Uh, that protects students uh, before they're able to exit the building. And as I indicated before, there's 10 stairwells and exits in the building that um, allow the building to be evacuated uh, fairly quickly. Some other things we want, the, uh, we want you to know from the project team, th this building will increase the housing stock. And as was Deb indicated earlier, it's greatly needed on this campus. We've been through a terrible year on campus with, uh, with lack of housing and having to house students in, in, in um, 
and hotels and motels around the area. Um, Munger Hall adds to the portfolio of available housing and it complements existing offerings uh, that we have with traditional residence halls and, and apartments. As I indicated before, it will be offered at below market rates. And having students buy food and cook food uh, greatly reduces the cost of, of, uh, of, of meals. So if you separate the, uh, the board from the room, the price tag goes down for students that occupy. And, uh, and, and these are students largely that would be going into Isla Vista and, and cooking for themselves anyway. The teaching kitchens that are, uh, and demonstration kitchens that are in the building will allow students to choose to, li that choose to live there to learn valuable skills uh, that better prepare them for the transition off, off campus housing. And the ground floor amenities and the amenity levels provides residents with a diverse set of spaces for students to utilize. And in addition to the ones I described earlier, music practice uh, spaces, tech centers, theaters, et cetera. Finally, some things we also want you to know um, that's largely geared towards second, third, and fourth year students, um, not first year students. So we're, you know, students coming here the first year get to know their fellow classmates um, and uh, buy a meal plan so they're not having to cook the first year they're here. But third, uh, third, second, third, and fourth year students largely go off to Isla Vista now, and so this is an al uh, alternative uh, for that um, uh, and a lower priced one. Um, in addition, it's uh, on camp for on-campus students that will also help alleviate some of the housing pressures in the broader community, uh, for instance, for the graduate students. And we recognize that, that Munger Hall uh, and its communal living design will not be um, for everybody and for every student. You'll get a choice. Some like it, some don't. And we know that uh, from, uh, from surveys that I'll share with you in just a second. The Academic Senate asked the Chancellor to, to, uh, to work with them to set up an independent panel to review Munger Hall and, makes, uh, uh, and make a re recommendation. Here's sort of a range of recommendations that might come out of that. It might pr uh, recommend that the campus proceed with minor revisions, in which case uh, we'll incorporate those minor revisions into the design and proceed with an environmental impact report, which may come out as early as the summer, uh, maybe later than that, depends on how many revisions have to be made. After uh, the EIR comes out and is reviewed, it'll go to the Regents for their approval. And uh, after the Regents, it'll go to the Coastal Commission for their approval. So there's a number of approval steps that still have to be uh, um, overcome uh, as, as in order for the building to proceed. If it, the recommendation is to proceed with major revisions, well, then we're probably looking at at least a couple of years to redesign the building. Not sure that the donor is going to be interested uh, in providing a co uh, contribution if the, if the revisions are too major. The third option is that they might recommend just to terminate the project and seek a new housing plan, in which case we go back to the drawing board, probably go back to the long range development plan uh, and, and see what the housing options are uh, there for the campus. We're looking at least a two to three year uh, for the design, if not longer. We will need a new donor at that point because we can't afford new housing without one these days. And in all likelihood, if we build it like San Joaquin uh, instead of Munger Hall, it will require three acres of land instead of 30 acres of land to accommodate 4,500 beds. I encourage you to go to the mock-up. There's a full-scale mock-up that's built on campus. Uh, you can sign up for tours. Here's the website, and I'm sure that Deb will make this website available to you um, in, in, a, uh, in a posting. Um, it's made a huge difference for students that go there, and we know that because we survey the students um, after they've visited the mock-up. So here's part of the survey. It asks the students uh, what their uh, attitude was towards Munger Hall before they came to the mock-up. The red means that they were negative about it. Purple means that they were supportive of it. Blue means that they were neutral. And you can see the vast majority of the students that come to the mock-up had a very negative opinion of it uh, before seeing the mock-up. After they've been to the mock-up, actually a, a much smaller fraction are negative, a much larger fraction are positive, and a much larger fraction are neutral. So seeing the mock-up and understanding what the, what the design is all about from the inside makes a big difference in the attitude of people that, uh, that are concerned about Munger Hall. So I look forward to your comments. We're still designing the building, so your input's appreciated. And, and again, thank you. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and um, share that presentation. So um, now I want to introduce um, the next group of folks we're going to be hearing from, um, which is the students of the ES-135B class, um, which has uh, been taught by Professor Rita Bright. So we're going to have, again, two panels of students. First, one group is going to come up. They're going to give two presentations. Then 
They'll go down, another panel will come up, and we'll have three more. I'm also going to introduce um, Professor Rita Bright now, and she is going to be um, running the, um, the uh, comment period at the, at the end, but she's also going to be speaking now. So I thought I'd just take this opportunity while I'm up here. And she's a really special person. I've been so uh, privileged to get to know her once I came to her class and spoke and have gotten to know her and her students as we've organized this evening. Rita Bright serves as an environmental studies program instructor teaching the upper divisions courses, principles of environmental planning and advanced principles of environmental planning. She also manages the city of Carpinteria's advanced planning division. Her specializations include environmental and policy analysis that address sea level rise and adaptation planning, social equity, environmental justice, resource protection, and neighborhood compatibility concerns. Previously, Professor Bright served as a deputy director for the County of Santa Barbara's Planning and Development Department and a principal at an international planning consultant firm where Ms. Bright led a team of planners and scientists who have been recognized with numerous state awarded studies, including the APA California chapter and Los Angeles chapter Paul Davidoff Award Advancing Diversity and Social Change for the City of Los Angeles Social Equity Program, and an Association of Environmental Professionals California Chapter Award for outstanding environmental analysis related to the County of Santa Cruz Cannabis License Program, EIR, which I understand can be a very tricky business. Professor Bright is an alumni of UCSB with a BA in Environmental Studies and Business Economics. So now I'd like to ask the ES-135B Advanced Principles of Environmental Planning class first panel to come on stage and please take your seats. Um, they, these students spent 10 weeks evaluating Munger Hall. And so they've really studied this project. I've seen their presentation. I think it's very thoughtful. I think it's going to be thought provoking. Uh, and I think it's really going to move the conversation forward about Munger Hall. So I know that Professor Bright is incredibly proud of them. I cannot wait to see this presentation. So uh, please join me in welcoming group one of ES-135. Take it away, folks. Thank you so much for that introduction, Deb. First, it has been both a pleasure and an honor to teach the students of the Advanced Principles of Environmental Planning classes, Porter. After several months of remote or hybrid learning, as many of the students experienced with me in our winter quarter in the Principles of Environmental Planning class, we had the ability to meet on campus this spring. During remote learning, many students shared their concerns with me privately related to spending so much of their university years in the remote learning model. Some of the comments, such as, I haven't had a chance to get an internship. This was a common one. I didn't envision my UCSB years at home. I'm not sure what future environmental careers will be out there. As a spring quarter instructor, I was committed to find ways the students could add to their resumes with a real life, controversial, juicy planning project. An in-person practicum that would feel like a planning studio in a public agency or consulting firm. At the end of winter quarter, I described my learning goals for this class. I asked if they would be interested in performing an adaptation plan based on a local and real sea level rise study, or develop a campus housing master plan inspired by the controversial Munger Hall project. Every student that approached me after class said, Munger Hall. It's real, it would affect students. They are the primary stakeholders. With extreme good fortune, we had met Deb Callahan, an alumni of the ES program and the chair of CHAMP. She actually flew down from her home in Marin County to guest speak, as Megan will also describe. She was enthusiastic with us from the get-go. After her presentation, 
we all realize that rather than have 43 students prepare 43 parallel planning studies, as CHAMP organized their own plans to address the Munger Hall project, we could combine our energy. What transpired was a collaborative, active learning inspired planning studio. Students shared ideas, research, data, as one would on a planning team. They had become a planning organization at its finest, as their bedrock was passion, passion, activism, advocacy. At its best doesn't start and end with a problem statement or simply a critique of what is wrong with a project. It reflects project understanding. By attending site visits, listening to project stakeholders, including proponents, learning the laws that govern, spending countless hours creatively searching together for a better outcome, they developed their own UCSB Student Housing Master Plan 2022 for a healthier community, socially and environmentally. They backed findings and recommendations with facts. This is integrity in planning. I am so proud to introduce you to the Advanced Principles of Environmental Planning class, starting with Megan Musolf, who will provide you with a presentation overview. Thank you. There is no better motivator for working on a project than when that project is rooted in your everyday life. Housing at UCSB is a lived experience for us as students here, and as our education has taught us to, we are always striving to make things better. In week four of this quarter, Deb Callahan came to speak to our class about the role of the civic sector and public participation in the planning process. At the time, the class was following a syllabus and writing weekly assignments with the end goal of creating an unofficial update to the campus's housing master plan. Munger Hall, of course, our main focus and concern. Deb spoke to us about how important it was that the public's opinion be heard throughout the planning process of any project, and our class quickly realized that the work we were doing could be directed towards something more impactful than just an in-class presentation. To our knowledge, the environmental impact report for Munger Hall was scheduled to be released in the summer, at a time when campus population is low and student engagement is reduced. We felt it necessary to bring Munger Hall to the spotlight during the school year, so crucial stakeholders, especially students, could make their voices heard, and the idea of a public forum was born. We mobilized quickly with our instructor, Rita Bright, forming groups based on our interests in the different sections of our housing plan. It was an intensely collaborative effort with group leaders coordinating information flows between groups, classmates sharing discoveries with each other as they came up, and Rita providing guidance throughout. These groups will each present their work tonight, and together the presentation represents our class's outline for an alternative UCSB housing plan that is policy consistent and meets the housing needs of the student body. Group one will give our project background, followed by group two highlighting the existing setting of the campus and Isla Vista. Group three will present our project's objectives, and the final group will present our proposed altern housing alternatives to Munger Hall and how they align with policy and our objectives. We will conclude with directions for future action. In only 10 weeks, my classmates and I have learned an incredible amount about the planning process, and now, with this presentation, are budding planners ourselves. The course and Rita's dedicated teaching provided us with a unique opportunity to work in a studio-like environment and create a final project with real-world implications on an issue we care deeply about. Our university's motto is Fiat Lux, let there be light. We hope that our presentation brings light to the issue of housing at UCSB 
and natural lighting to every student bedroom. Thank you. Up next, I'd like to present my classmate, Sarah Jagger, who will present our project background. Hi, everyone. I'd like to begin by providing context for our presentation through explaining the background of UCSB's housing developments. As seen on these maps, UCSB and Isla Vista have a long history of development, the majority of which has been solely for the purpose of the university and the needs of its students. The campus hosts a multitude of structures, including classrooms, dining commons, labs, and of course, dorms. In accordance with campus development and continual population growth, the neighboring community of Isla Vista now also boasts a dense collection of buildings, primarily businesses and houses. At the end of World War II, the Marine Corps sold the campus to the UC Regents, who then appointed this as the new location for Santa Barbara College. In 1958, the college was redesignated as a UC campus. Many structures in the university's early history were repurposed to Marine Corps buildings, but increasing enrollment soon prompted new construction. Campus enrollment began at 2,500 students in 1954, and by the fall of 2021 was totaled at 26,179 students. Still, enrollment continues to grow, meaning that the development of the campus also continues. New structures such as Henley Hall and the upcoming classroom building are apparent on campus. Meanwhile, our population has reached numbers meriting a need for new housing that has not yet come into fruition. In discussing housing and the history of the university, we must also, of course, recognize Isla Vista, which is a community governed by the County of Santa Barbara. In the early 1900s, the oil industry and real estate developers subdivided Isla Vista into residential lots. Students looked to IV for housing as UCSB enrollment grew, and in the 1960s, the Santa Barbara Board of Supervisors announced that housing standards and zoning laws would not be strictly enforced. Development increased following this announcement as landlords were able to maximize their profits. While student-led activism was widely successful in improving conditions within Isla Vista, the limited housing market still poses a threat that the university has been pressured to overtake. Today, about 40% of UCSB students are living in Isla Vista. Though campus plans limit enrollment from exceeding 25,000 students, this total is calculated based on a three-quarter average, meaning that fall quarter's population isn't exactly restricted to this limit. Also specified by plans is a maximum student growth rate of 1%. When calculating growth based on just fall quarter, this rate is closer to 1.5%. And between 1995 and 2009, the rate was 1.4%, and as shown in this table, the average remains about the same. This past year, COVID aggregated aggregated existing housing issues, resulting in excess students being unable to secure a place to live. The university ultimately made an agreement with local hotels to provide temporary housing. If not already obvious, this situation made it clear that we need to develop more university housing. And this brings us back to UCSB's development, which has been dictated by nine total campus and master plans, now referred to as long-range development plans or LRDPs. These plans guide the physical development at UCSB with assigned land use designations, principles, and policies. Dormitories, open spaces, and classroom buildings are some examples we can think of that these guidelines apply to. Previous plans accounted for four waves of increased enrollment between 1950 and 2010. Our current LRDP was created in 2010 when enrollment was around 20,000 students. In order to accommodate 5,000 more students, the university outlined a goal of housing 100% of them in university housing, with a total of 5,653 new bed spaces, 103 of which were, be, were to be provided in San Joaquin, the rest being at the facilities management site and east side residential halls. These locations are in orange on the map. Additional housing proponents exist in the other orange sections, 
and these would provide units designated for a mix of students, faculty, and staff. Now at the tail end of the time frame dictated by the 2010 LRDP, we're experiencing a surge in public response towards UCSB's housing crisis and Munger Hall specifically. It is clear that there is a need for more housing, but there has been dispute over how the university should provide this. Students, community members, and UC campus architects have expressed concern about the design of Munger Hall. Given this attention, we found it extremely important to determine the history of UCSB's campus, what students want in university housing, and what we can do from here. So now I would like to introduce Dante Reedy Solano to discuss UCSB's environmental and housing setting. Thank you everyone, my name is Dante Solano and I'll be giving a brief introduction into UCSB's environmental housing setting. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, UCSB's campus is located on the southern coastal terrace south of the city of Goleta, we see right here. Um, cons it's constituted of four principal campuses of Maine, Stork, West, and North Campus, as you can see right there. On main campus, we'll see the principal landmarks being the Stork Tower, obviously, the tallest building on campus, the USEN, the Davidson and Central Libraries, being the main vantage point for intercampus uh, commutes, from, because uh, a majority of lecture halls are within a five minute walk. From which, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Sorry. Uh, the protected areas on main campus include Devereux Lagoon, the east and west bluffs, or east and north bluffs, and the emergent, the emergent project of the Ocean Road housing, which has been approved, and my partner will go into further detail on that. Uh, Stork Campus consists of seven housing buildings, Harder Stadium, recreational facilities, and undeveloped seasonal wetlands. The freshman housing building is the Santa Catalina Towers, which consists of the north and south tower. The rest of Stork Campus is primarily for juniors, transfer students, third and fourth years, and uh, some faculty. And also is, we have the San Clemente, uh, San Clemente housing facilities, which are primarily for grad students. However, in the year 2021, parts of, other parts of Stork Campus were utilized for grad housing as Santa Catalina was completely full. Yeah. On North Campus, we can find a 174 acres of uh, primarily three housing complexes. We have the North, North Campus faculty housing, uh, which is uh, primarily the closest thing we have to actual houses on campus. The, the other two being the Sierra Madre villages, which are similar to San Joaquin in that they are for transfer third and fourth year students. And then finally, we have the Sierra Madre uh, family housing adjacent to that on Stork Road, which is for primarily for students with families and some faculty with families. But it resembles more of an apartment complex compared to North Campus faculty housing. And emerging projects on that, we have the uh, Ocean Road Ocean Walk, sorry, fa faculty housing. And then finally, we have West Campus, which is 274 acres of open space, which includes the Devereux Slough, the uh, Coal Oil Point Natural Reserve, public walking trails, and we have two faculty housing, uh, two existing faculty housing complexes, the West Campus Apartments and the West Campus Faculty Housing, and an early project which is yet to be approved or in the early stages of approval called the Devereux Housing Projects, which is currently not reflected in our current RLODP. And now to pass it on to my partner, uh, Ms. Ailey Slater. Thank you. So as many of us know, there are a lot of UCSB housing facilities, um, mainly uh, for undergraduate students, but there are housing facilities designated for graduate students, students with families, and faculty and staff. Now most of these housing facilities are on Maine and Stork campus, simply because West and North Campus are a lot of designated open space and recreational space, and they're also a lot far further from the academic facilities on main campus. Now from the campus profile from this school year, um, about 40% of UCSB students live in UCSB facilities, another 40% live in Isla Vista, and the rest live in Goleta and the local community, or another location, including study abroad or students learning remotely. Now there is a clear need for um, more housing or a clear demand for more housing as there were 900 students on the UCSB housing wait list in the fall of this school year. So according to the 2010 LRDP, there were two um, numbers that kept sticking out regarding housing requirements. 
So there is the land use policy too, um, which basically stated that there needed to be uh, enough beds to house 100% of students above a 20,000 student threshold up to a cap of 25,000 students. So that meant 5,000 additional beds. There's also one of the key principles in the LRDP that said that we wanna be able to house 50% of the student population. So based on this school year's student population, that would be 13,062 beds total. So the first number is 5,000 added, the second is 13,062 total. Now in land use policy two, it also stated that there, we needed to have 1,800 faculty units as well. So there are a few pending housing projects. Um, of course, there's Munger Hall for student housing, which would have 4,536 beds. Um, but due to the nature of our presentation, we're not going to include that number in the next few slides um, for some calculations. There are also three pending faculty projects. Um, the Ocean Walk housing project um, is already in development. Some are already finished, but there are about 70 units that are still in development. Um, the Ocean Road housing project very recently got approved, and so that will add 540 units of faculty housing. And lastly, the Devereaux housing project, which is in the early planning stages. So using the existing housing numbers and those pending numbers that I just showed, we calculated the gap between the established housing that we have and the housing that is required by those numbers in the LRDP. So as I'd mentioned earlier, there are two key numbers for student housing. And so using that and the numbers that are pending, we calculated this gap. So the 2010 LRDP is actually based on existing housing bed counts from 2007. So we also used those numbers um, to find what was existing in 2007, how many beds have been built or added to existing dorms since then, and then the pending. So we found that the gap is between 1,287 beds and 3,081 beds for student housing. For faculty using that same process, we found that we needed 876 units. So just to reiterate, I know we heard more about this earlier, but Munger Hall is proposed to be on the northwestern corner of main campus and will be located where the current facilities management complex is, which will be moved off site or off of main campus. The location, or the proposed location, stands on a bluff that is designated as an ESHA, an environmentally sensitive habitat area. Um, and it's surrounded by public safety offices, the Santa Barbara Airport, the baseball stadium to the south, um, hazardous waste facilities, and also Harder Stadium. Now just to reiterate, um, this project is proposing 4,536 beds. It's 11 stories tall um, with recreational facilities um, as well as other academic facilities. There's also limited parking and pick up and drop off spaces to the north and bike and walking paths to provide transportation for students to main campus. Now just to finish off this part, uh, we just wanted to show once again the top and bottom floors of the proposed Munger Hall with um, the building management facilities as well as the top floor with the atrium surrounded by academic facilities, um, uh, recreational areas, and activities. And lastly, just a picture of the Munger Hall wing, um, or one of the houses, as they're called, showing the main common room um, for the house and then those eight suites. Now I'm gonna pass it over to our project objectives group. Hello, uh, my name is Milan and I'll be presenting the first half of the objectives and then my teammate Molly Cunningham will finish those off. Project objectives are the attainable and time-bound statements to support concepts or goals. And they provide a set of guidelines for current and future use and physical development of the land, including protection measures for such land. We would like to note that the following project objectives have been carefully developed by our class based on thoughtful analysis, um, consideration of our values, visions for a healthy campus environment, and include some concepts that are promoted in the existing LRDP. Objective number one is to house 50% of the student population in university-owned housing, including all new students who are freshmen and transfer students, and to house 1,800 faculty and staff. 
Objective number two is to work collaboratively and closely with the County of Santa Barbara to adopt an Isla Vista master plan, which will include a shared and rental restricted housing program in order to increase the housing supply by a minimum of 10% of the student population. Objective three is to adopt an LRDP 2040 update by 2028, which will not permit a maximum student enrollment growth rate of 1% until commensurate campus housing targets for students, staff, and faculty are constructed and occupied. Objective four is to increase on-site renewable energy generation in order to meet UCSB's carbon neutrality goal by 2025 by holding a minimum standard of LEED Platinum accreditation for newly, and for newly built and renovated buildings. Objective five is to comply with the American Disability Act as well as the newer ADA standards for accessible design. Hi, I'm Molly. So objective six is to maintain the aesthetic appearance of the campus and cohesion amongst buildings, emphasizing a campus setting harmonious with a unique natural environment, which should be the focus of campus spaces and more closely integrated into the patterns and circulation of use. Objective seven is to provide fundamental quality of life design standards for campus housing, which includes natural ventilation and light in every bedroom and living room and common space. Objective eight, to provide accessible, healthy, and affordable meals to students within a maximum 15 minute walking distance of each residence hall, as well as well lit and safe access to all dining halls. Objective nine, to maintain university-owned or managed student housing that is 100% affordable permanently at the low and very low household income levels for Santa Barbara County. Objective 10, to maintain the purpose and intent of the Coastal Act and its coastal resource policies through measures such as protection of environmentally sensitive habitat areas, otherwise known as ESHA, by maintaining an absolute minimum buffer of at least 50 feet. Objective 11, to provide student, staff, and faculty with direct access to campus and community resources by emphasizing safe bike path development, pedestrian walkways, and bus routes with headways of 15 minutes or less. And the last objective is to prioritize retrofitting and repurposing of existing building sites over the new construction of housing buildings on undeveloped greenfield sites. This framework provides meaningful steps towards reaching specific goals for UCSB and Isla Vista by clearly stating the expectations for the projects. Through meeting these objectives, we hope to ensure that the student alternative master plan reflects the needs and desires of the campus stakeholders, including UCSB students. Thank you. Thank you very much for those presentations. And so I think now we wanna first have this first group, please, well, please uh, thank the first group for their wonderful presentations. And if I can have the second group, please come on and enter the stage and leave the clicker behind. <laughs> Will be a little less crowded this time. Here we come. Welcome to the stage. Terrific, thank you so much. All right, well, I'd like to introduce group two of Environmental Studies 135B class and take it away, folks, thank you. Hello, my name is Audrey Lucio and I will be presenting relevant policies that our student proposed sites wish to prioritize. First, we wish to uphold the entirety of the California Coastal Act, 
but we specifically want to highlight Section 30107.5, which defines environmentally sensitive habitats as any area in which plant and animal life are valuable because of their special nature. Section 30240 states development projects adjacent to ESHAs shall be compatible with the continuance of those habitats. Section 30250A states new residential development shall be in proximity of existing development. Additionally, new development locations shall not have adverse effects on coastal resources. And Section 30251 states new development must be sited and designed to protect views along the coast. And this map identifies the ESHA zones in light green and the ESHA buffer zones in dark green. Additionally, all policies within the LRDP follow the California Coastal Act. Therefore, adhering to existing policies is most ideal for future development. Within the LRDP planning principles, it states that future development should prioritize the preservation of natural features alternate forms of transportation, compact development, and providing everyday needs within walking distance. Introduction policy two states that if there's any conflict with the LRDP, policies most protective of coastal resources shall control. ESHA policy 17 states, ESHA on campus shall be protected, feasible, enhanced, and restored. And scenic policy three states, new development shall be cited and designed to minimize adverse impacts to the greatest extent feasible on scenic resources. The sustainability section of the LRDP planning concept states built environments should create superior places to study, work, and live that enhance the health and performance of building occupants through sustainable planning, design, construction, operations, retrofits, and biomimicry. Now we'll have Zachary Arreche Ramos, who will be presenting our student housing plan and the first housing opportunity sites for the main campus. Hi everyone, I'm Zachary Arreche Ramos, and I will be introducing the main uh, housing development plan and our first large opportunity site. So first, before I get into the opportunity site, I would like to discuss the plan. We have broken it down into two separate phases. The first phase being the development of completely new housing, and this is going to tackle the immediate student housing crisis and deficit in bed spaces. Our second phase of the plan will be the redevelopment of or addition to existing housing developments on campus. We are prioritizing phase one in front of phase two because we need the immediate beds for the student housing crisis as it is, and uh, phase two may also create a slight uh, usage or lack of beds during the redevelopment phase, so we'd prefer to have those beds ahead of time through new developments before we redevelop. All of the projects and housing sites that we are going to propose here are going to be proposed in the order that we anticipate them to be approved and completed. And just before I get onto this uh, first housing site, we are gonna go over just some little things here. Uh, all of our numbers that we get are based on existing new CSB housing sites and dormitories. We use the density of student bed spaces per acreage of the land that they occupy in their buildings. And each housing site is going to propose a low density uh, estimate and a high density estimate to give the university a range of options to choose from when building this housing. Of course, all of our proposed housing sites are conceptual and both professional and community input is highly encouraged. Of course, there will also need to be an independent cost benefit analysis done on the construction of the dorms but it is our goal that all of these sites we propose are options to the university instead of the currently proposed Munger Hall. So now on to facilities management. We have, uh, so the facilities management site we chose is the exact same site as where Munger Hall is being proposed. It is a nine acre development split by Mesa Road into a southern and northern portion. And one of the most important things to deal with here is that in the 2010 LRDP, we actually have the policy land use dash 10 that highlights some important restrictions on it that the university set itself. Uh, some of these restrictions include a maximum of 2,250 bed spaces on the site, and there are also height restrictions of 65 foot uh, height levels on the south and 35 foot height restrictions on the north portion of the site. 
along with the ESHA barrier of 50 feet for the on-site wetland. So now on to the actual proposal. We are proposing a housing development on the southern 4.5 acre portion. We are basing this roughly on the floor density and the building structure of the Santa Catalina residence halls. For the low estimate build, we offer a 4.5, uh, sorry, for the low density build, we have uh, three five-story buildings that will all be less than 65 feet. Uh, these will come in at about 0 0.4 acres per each building for a total of 1.2 acres for the development. These buildings at the low density will house about 410 beds per building with 82 per floor for a total of 1,230 student beds. We also have a high build estimate and this will be broken down into four five-story towers with increased density, all still remaining under the 65-foot height limit. These will include 560 beds per tower with 112 per floor for a total of 2,240 beds, coming in at just under 10 under the maximum amount of beds allowed on this site. Of course, for the increased density of bed spaces, the building footprint will be expanded for each individual building to 0.5 acres, increasing the total housing development to two acres on the plot of 3.5 acres. These options that we give uh, address a range of 1,230 bed spaces to 2,240 bed spaces that the university can choose from to build. We are also proposing a dining common on or nearby the site. We have two potential options for this, the 4.5 acre northern lot section, which would be, oh, whoops, my bad, uh, up here. Up here. And then, so the southern section with the housing will be right there. Um, and so for the dining common, we actually have the site on either the 4.5 acre northern portion or to actually use lot 30 right there uh, and create a multi-use building with the first two, levers be, first two levels being parking structure with the dining common on the third story. Using this will increase parking and have a dining common nearby, whereas also putting the dining common on the north section of the lot would still remain under the 35 foot height limit requirement. Regardless of where we put the dining common, we would still increase lot 30 into a multi-level parking garage, and this is supported in policy land use dash eight, which allows us to convert a parking lot to a parking garage to maintain one parking spot per every four new bed spaces added. Now I will go into the policy consistency of our new proposed uh, dorms and housing, and how this, we follow the policies and what Monger Hall does not and conflicts with. So for the first one, as you've already heard me mention, we have the land use policy 10. This keeps, our development keeps the approved guidelines set in the LRDP, especially under maximum bed counts, whereas Munger Hall does not. It violates the LRDP and goes up to 4,000. We also are following, uh, we are also are following policy transportation 15, which is including the parking spaces. We are supposed to build one new parking space for every four new bed spaces added. Munger Hall, aside from the drop-off and pick-up drop pick spots, has no new proposed housing. We are also in compliance with policy ESH-31, or the ESHA buffers. We are keeping and maintaining the 50-foot buffer for all nearby uh, sensitive habitats, whereas Munger Hall actually plans to reduce this to 25 feet because of its size. Uh, we are also in compliance with scenic policy 03, um, which I've already demonstrated. We are underneath the height limits whereas opposed to Munger Hall's 11-story, nearly 159-foot tall structure would not be in compliance. The issue with not being in compliance here is that these would require amendments to the 2010 LRDP, and in result of that, uh, Senate Bill 886 would no longer apply, which means Munger Hall would now be open uh, to the California Environmental Quality Act and must receive the Coastal Commission certification. On to the objectives and what our specific site and proposal here agrees with, because we want to make sure that we're in line with that. For objective consistency, our increasing of bed spaces from anywhere to 1,230 spaces to 2,240 spaces will contribute and help reach that 50% of housing students on university-owned housing, meeting objective one. We also will have all of our designs follow the LEED Platinum standards, adhere to ADA standards on accessible design, maintain the aesthetic, of appearance, aesthetic appearance of the campus, and provide quality of life standards, such as windows for every dorm, to meet objectives four, five, six, and seven. We also are proposing our dining common to meet food security as outlined in objective eight. Objective nine will be met by planning this housing to be available to low and very low income students. Uh, we are also keeping, as mentioned before, the 50 foot buffer uh, for 
the Coastal Act Integrity outlined in Objective 10. Roads and bike paths are already nearby the site as shown earlier, and these will be enhanced to increase connectivity to campus for Objective 11. And utilizing the site of facilities management preserves existing open spaces and undeveloped green fields to meet Objective 12 on sustainable development. This site and this proposed housing meets our own objectives thoroughly and the policies outlined in the LRDP, which Munger Hall does not. Therefore, this is the superior alternative specifically for this facilities management site. Next up is Samuel Simons on other housing sites that we have. Um, I'm Samuel Simons and I'll be discussing our proposals for potential housing sites on the rest of <clears throat> main campus. So the first site we'll be looking at is lot 16, which is a parking lot north of Cheetah Hall and east of the Recreation Center. It's actually directly northwest of this building, so just outside, you can probably see it from the front steps. The uh, total acreage of our proposed project is about two acres, with a density similar to the existing Manzanita Villages, which are on West Main Campus. Depending on the final build density chosen, we could be adding anywhere from 450 to about 560 beds at this facility. As I'll elaborate on later, this site has been selected for consistency with our existing policies and consistency with the objectives, uh, as well as compatibility with the proposed development at the facilities management site. Um, because this site is adjacent to lots 14 and 16C, which you can see here, uh, that's 16C, and this is 14, uh, those lots will be expanded with either underground or multi-level parking structures to accommodate for the increased demand for parking caused by the new uh, residence halls and to mitigate the lost parking spaces because of the redevelopment of lot 16. Um, this site is nearby to existing transportation infrastructure, including Mesa Road, as well as the bus loop, which can connect residents to the MTD transportation network, as well as the fact that it's near existing bike paths, so there's limited need for new construction of transportation infrastructure. Residents of a proposed dining, uh, proposed um, residence hall here could make use of the dining commons that would be constructed at the, at the proposed facilities management site. Now on to policy consistency. This uh, proposal is fully consistent with the existing policy. It's within the housing cap that's been placed on main campus under land use policy 17. Um, because the parking lot that would be redeveloped does not contain any coastal access parking spaces, this development would avoid the lengthy process of approval for um, interfering with the existing designated coastal access parking spaces. This proposed site would be perfectly in line with Cheadle Hall, which can be seen in the, the here, which means there'd be no destruction in sight lines looking south towards the beach. Cheadle Hall can be seen here at the bottom. So any sight lines looking north towards the mountains would already be blocked by Cheadle Hall, as well as, well as any sight lines looking south towards the ocean would already be blocked by Cheadle Hall. Because of the expansions of lot 16C and lot 14, um, this site would meet the parking requirement for a new parking sites for new housing, making it fully consistent with policy, transportation policy 16. Because this site would be constructed near the recreation center, there would be no need for building an on-site gym. By the way, the recreation center can be seen here, just off the edge of this photo. Let's move on to objective consistency. This project is fully consistent with the objectives that we've outlined for our project. Um, it's fully consistent with objective one, to add housing to meet the housing deficit that we have already. Uh, the facility would be designed uh, to be fully in accordance with our objectives for energy sustainability, accessibility, and harmony with the natural setting, as well as basic standards of living covered in objectives four, five, six, and seven. This site would be near the uh, facilities management dining commons proposed previously, making it fully in line with objective eight on food security. Because this site is distant from any ESHA zones, it maintains a 50-foot buffer zone, bringing us in line with objective 10. Because of proximity to existing infrastructure, this project would be fully consistent with objective 11, um, allowing for students to have adequate transportation without significant expansion of transportation infrastructure. 
Because we're choosing to redevelop an existing parking lot, we're avoiding developing upon existing untouched green space, bringing us in line with objective 12 on sustainable development. Now to move on to phase two, as we've discussed, this development will, will result in a temporary um, reduction or disruption of housing stock, and for that reason, we'd only move forward after expanding the existing housing stock in phase one. Our first site in phase two are the east side residence halls. These are some existing dorms, um, San, sorry. Apologies. San Catalina, or sorry, Santa Cruz, Anna Kappa, and Santa Rosa, sorry about that. Um, and our plan would be to add existing towers over the one-story lobby areas. Our initial plan for this site was a much more expansive retrofit or redevelopment, but because of the investments in retrofitting and the land use policies governing this site, we've chosen for a much more restrained approach. The two, uh, sorry. The, the one story can be seen here, and we'd be building on top of this existing one story area towers of either two, three, or four stories, depending on the density chosen. For the less intensive plan, we'd be adding 651 beds in three stories over Santa Rosa Lobby and two stories on Santa Cruz and Anacapa Lobbies. For a more intensive plan, we would be adding 1,092 beds um, by adding four stories over the lobbies of all four of all three dining halls. Both plans would lead to a temporary disruption of housing stock while under construction and would require increased staffing and hours at DLG Dining Commons. However, they would not require construction of a new Dining Commons. On to policy consistency. Um, the main policy that's restraining our development in this area is land use policy LU16 in the LRDP. It sets the cap on beds at 3,968. It also sets limage on site coverage, ground square footage, and maximum building heights. Our plan for increasing bed limits would be fully within the limit set. Because this would be an expansion of existing dorms, there would be minimal footprint change, which places us within the limits on site coverage and ground square footage. The, the existing dorms already block views of the beach. Because of this, this project would minimize adverse effects on scenic and visual resources, bringing us in line with scenic policy three. The floor density calculations that we've done will account for lounges and shared spaces, and because our expansions are within an existing project area, it does not approach the ESHA boundary and is fully consistent with the California Coastal Act. Now onto consistency with our objectives. Because of the added dorm spaces, we'll be adding beds and helping with the housing deficit under objective one. We'll be leaving uh, roofs and parking lots available to add solar power generation, bringing us consistency with objective four. The site would be designed to meet our objectives on accessibility, harmony with the natural setting, and standard of living objectives, five, six, and seven. Because the site would be near an existing dining commons, it would bring us in line with objective eight for food security. Because the site is fully within an existing project site, it would be limited change to the total project area, and no need for an ESHA zone reduction, bringing us um, in accordance with objective 10. Because this would be an addition to existing dorms, it can take full advantage of the existing transportation infrastructure, including bike routes, Yusen Road, Channel Islands Road, Lagoon Road, as well as nearby bus routes. There would be extremely minimal footprint increase, preserving the retrofitting that's already been done to Anacapa, Santa Cruz, and Santa Rosa, and preserving the investments that have already been made in these sites. This also brings us in line with Objective 12 on sustainable development. And that is the final site on main campus that we're looking at, and I'm gonna hand it off to C.R. Sterling, who will be discussing redevelopment of the San Yaz facility on Stork campus. Thanks, Samuel. Um, okay. So the second part of phase two would be to redevelop um, the Santa Inez apartments on the corner of Los Carneros and El Colegio. Um, and this is on Stork campus. This site is ideal for redevelopment because it's currently quite low density at about 50 people per acre. Um, and the buildings are getting old and are frankly in need of some updates anyway. Um, this site's actually been considered in the past by UCSB um, for redevelopment to add to the housing stock. Um, so there's actually already some framework in the 2010 long-range development plan to guide that. 
Um, the proposed area of the site is about 17 acres, which you can see outlined in gold on the slide. Um, we found this area with respect to the surrounding open space um, and environmentally sensitive habitat areas. So we've come up with two scenarios, um, a low build and a high build. For our low build scenario, we've determined we could fit 2,000 beds on the site using a three-story Sierra Madre Villages style apartment complex. Um, and this apartment complex would include laundry rooms, fitness and recreation centers, elevators, an evacuation site, and a three-story parking garage. For our high build scenario, we determined that we could fit 3,212 bed spaces, which is the maximum allowable for the site. To do this, we would use a, um, some higher density, three-story dorm buildings in the style of Anna Kappa Residence Hall. It would also be possible to add a dining commons to this site, um, just to accommodate the large student population and decrease the stress on Portola dining commons. So in our analysis, we've determined that this project would be consistent with existing policy. Um, first, it would maintain ESHA buffers of at least 50 feet. Um, and ESHAs are shown here on this bottom picture on the slide, um, represented by the yellow circles. So there's some just north of the site and also um, southeast and southwest of the site. Um, furthermore, a good chunk of this site is actually excluded from the coastal zone. Um, this crosshatched area on the slide represents a coastal zone exclusion here and um, just north up here. And this is gonna make it a bit easier to obtain development permits um, as well as give some more freedom in the design. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, because the site's already been considered by the UC for redevelopment, there's existing policy in the 2010 LRDP specific to it. Um, policy LU25 states that building heights can't exceed a maximum of 45 feet, which is just about three stories. It also states that site coverage shouldn't exceed 50%, which is something that we've accounted for in both our low build and high build projections. Um, and last, this policy stipulates a maximum on-site population of 2,920. Um, however, policy LU3 states that populations on a given site can exceed 10% of the maximum without requiring an amendment to the LRDP. Um, so this means that our high build projection of 3,212 bed spaces would ultimately be allowable. So just to review some of the objectives that this um, redevelopment would meet, it meets our fourth, fifth, and sixth and seventh objectives, which are our sustainability, accessibility, aesthetics, and standard of living objectives. Um, it also meets our food security objective because it's just about an eight minute walk from Portola Dining Commons. And as I mentioned, it would be possible to add a new dining hall on the site. It also meets our 10th objective because it maintains ESHA buffers of at least 50 feet. And lastly, it meets our 12th objective because it would be retrofitting an existing building site um, and in doing so, avoid developing on undeveloped green space. So now I'm going to hand it off to Ashley Cooter to talk a bit about housing in Isla Vista. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ashley, and I'm gonna briefly go over some of the issues that we see with housing in Isla Vista, and then talk about some of the solutions that our group is proposing. So, about 40% of the UCSB undergraduate student body lives in the neighboring town of Isla Vista. This is not to mention many graduate students and faculty members that also call Ivy home. Ivy is really by definition a college town. The majority of its population are UCSB students. Because of this, you can't separate issues of UCSB housing with Isla Vista housing. The two are intimately connected. As locals have come to know and accept, many housing issues exist in IV. There are conflicts between actual density and existing zoning laws. 
crowding students into homes that are, were not built nor zoned for their current density. Personally, I have friends that live in vans, living rooms, garages, simply because that's the only housing they could find. Homes in IV are old and suffer from energy and water inefficiency, black mold, cockroach infestations, and are just generally in poor condition. Land use in IV is also highly inefficient, with huge seldom used backyards and empty lots taking up valuable acreage, meanwhile students struggle to find affordable housing. These issues will only get worse without intervention, as eroding bluffs along Del Playa eat up existing dense housing stock, and new apartments that are being built are charging of upward $1,300 for a space in a double bedroom. All in the meantime, a growing student body looks to IV to fill their housing needs. So this map was featured in the Isla Vista Master Plan. The Master Plan is a document co-sponsored by Santa Barbara County, the University, and the Isla Vista Recreation and Park District with intentions to guide development of Isla Vista towards a safer, cleaner, and more attractive environment for its residents. In March 2016, the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors considered, but ultimately did not approve the Isla Vista Master Plan. Although the plan was not approved, many of its goals remain really relevant today. A crucial aspect of the Isla Vista Master Plan is the proposed Isla Vista form-based zoning code targeted at residential and mixed-use commercial residential buildings with a focus on density, that's pictured here on this map. To spur new development and increase student housing, it proposes an incentive program on the 6-5 block, denoted here by that dashed line. That incentive program, the Isla Vista Built Right Housing Incentive Program, would encourage developers to combine tiny parcels to build large residential buildings, to use green building techniques, and to combine public infrastructure via sidewalks, trees, and more. The incentive is a density bonus, which means that projects that meet the program's guidelines would be allowed more units per acre than what would typically be allowed through the regular zoning code. In addition to the Built Right Incentive Program, the state of California offers state density bonus program incentives. Under those incentives, projects are eligible if they designate certain percentages of their housing for very low to moderate income residents and or college students. Because of these two programs, Isla Vista Housing is ripe for development that can take advantage of both density programs and the two programs are not mutually exclusive, so in theory, developers could take advantage of both at the same time. These programs' incentives, along with the constant flow of tenants who will attend UCSB, can make parcels and IV especially attractive to developers looking to increase density. Additionally, when discussing housing and IV, we have to talk about parking. Parking is a major issue in IV, and included in any density increase would have to be a mobility analysis to address parking concerns. The IV Master Plan suggests a couple of solutions, like a public parking structure and a permitting system. These solutions and others should be considered with mobility analysis as part of any density increase projects. So, the County of Santa Barbara, which has legal jurisdiction over Isla Vista, has very good reason to support IV housing, even though in the past they really haven't. They must create 1,766 very low and low income housing units by 2031 to meet the arena objectives set by the state of California. So firstly, we propose that the County of Santa Barbara prioritize Isla Vista in its housing discussions and pass, at the very least, the Isla Vista form-based zoning code and the Isla Vista Built Right Housing Incentive Program. And if the county passes an iteration of the master plan, or at least these very crucial portions of it, the housing programs provide an ample opportunity for the county to meet their state RENA objectives in Isla Vista. UCSB is a stakeholder with massive influence in IV and should strongly support the passing of these policies as well. Secondly, we propose that the County of Santa Barbara and UCSB should partner to develop 100% affordable housing projects in Isla Vista and maximize density to the extent feasible under the two density bonuses. They should also create an agreement to establish permanent rental controls for any housing developed and redeveloped in IV to keep affordable housing in IV actually affordable. We also recommend that the County of Santa Barbara should work to encourage owners of single-family homes in IV, many of which have really large lots, to build accessory dwelling units. The state of California has already prioritized ADUs in its housing solutions and has removed many restrictions surrounding their construction. Lots of yards in IV have space for another home, and ADUs could benefit both owners and tenants. Some properties have begun to take this approach in IV already, but this trend should be further promoted. We also recommend that Isla Vista should build up to increase density. The tallest buildings in IV are four stories, with commercial on the bottom and apartments on the upper floors. Although the Coastal Commission sets a building height limit of 35 feet, minor conditional use permits allow developers to build higher than this, and the precedent of those four-story buildings in IV, like the Loop Apartments, demonstrates success in creating taller, mixed-use development. 
More buildings should be built up, especially along the main commercial stretch of the Embarcadero Loop, as this action would increase density, efficiency, walkability, and just overall quality of life in IB. UCSB owns and operates two undergraduate student apartment complexes located in IB, Westgate and El Dorado. We believe these should both be targets for density increase projects as well. Westgate operates 22 single occupancy studio apartments. Typically in IV, studios have two or three people, and the Westgate ones could easily be made into doubles. Additionally, both buildings are two stories right now, and in their location along El Colegio, their neighbors are much taller. It would not create significant visual impact for these buildings to increase from two to four stories, and by doing this, their existing density could essentially double. Both the studio density increase and height increase projects could bring the number of students housed in campus-owned IV apartments from 200 to 466. The university has so many reasons to support redevelopment in IV, including less pressure on university housing, an improved neighborhood surrounding the campus, and improved livelihoods for its own student body who lives there. The university may also see decreased tensions between itself and the city of Goleta if the vast majority of students are able to be housed on campus and in Isla Vista, and not within Goleta where the housing supply is already very limited and very expensive. The university has taken a hands-off approach to Isla Vista in the past, but in the midst of a housing crisis, this does not need to be its future. UCSB should create a lasting partnership with entities in IV, like the IV Community Services District, to address housing and parking needs. In future long-range development plans, UCSB must consider university housing in IV to ensure this vital part of the campus community is not forgotten. Thank you. Now I would like to welcome back Audrey Lucio, who will briefly touch on housing in North and West Campus. We, we move to dismiss development on North and West Campus because the area is mostly comprised of environmentally sensitive habitats. Additionally, land use policy 21 states that North Campus open space shall remain, op shall remain open for habitat conservation and public access in perpetuity. Now we have Matthew Winter presenting our findings. Hello, my name is Matthew Winner, and I'll be summarizing our findings. So our summarized findings are shown in this table. In total, our proposed products would create between 3,731 to 6,573 new university-owned student bed spaces to help address the university's current housing deficit. As of this year, the university needs between approximately 1,287 to 3,081 new student bed spaces to fulfill the current student housing demands. Our table emphasizes that our proposed products would enable the university to meet current and future student housing needs. Further, the products would ensure students are able to live on campus to alleviate housing pressures in the city of Goleta and city of Santa Barbara. Moreover, a partnership between the county of Santa Barbara and the university would help increase available student housing in Isla Vista to ensure students can live adjacent to campus and feel a part of the UCSB community. Ultimately, our goal is to provide the university with potential housing alternatives to Munger Hall that would effectively create new student housing and maintain policies defined in the university's long-range development plan. While Munger Hall would create new student housing on campus, the currently proposed product is inconsistent with long-range development plan policies. Our alternatives would meet the student housing needs and be more consistent with the long-range development plan. Therefore, our student housing products are superior alternatives to Munger Hall. Our proposed products are guided by the LRDP to maintain sustainable planning practices that would improve the quality of life for students protect and preserve natural resources, and create an inclusive community that prospers academically and environmentally. We look forward to receiving your feedback. Mertz Vasquez will now discuss future steps and considerations. Thank you, Matthew. Hello, my name is Mertz Vasquez, and I will be providing our closing comments, and we invite you to stay for our public comment period right after. If there is one thing we hope you got from our presentations, is the importance of the UCSB administration to work with its main stakeholders, us, the students. Since first release to the public, Munger Hall has been anything, treated with anything but acceptance by the public and students. And it doesn't have to be this way if we can only work together because of lack of transparency 
and spread of misconceptions have been the, a source of the issue. We hope you can consider our housing alternatives, which have been considerably thought through with copious knowledge and research, and not Munger's self-proclaimed -proc licenses. Our findings show that there are several inconsistencies with campus and coastal policy and Munger Hall. The long-range development plan should not have to be amended every time the university wants a project to be consistent with policy. As the date of the next LRDP approaches in 2025, we ask that there is more collaboration with students and faculty in terms of procedures leading on to, to housing project proposals. Therefore, we would like to see Isla Vista included in the next LRDP and address the 40% of students that live there. In addition, the environmental impact report is to be released this summer, which is an inadequate time for student opportunity to comment. A 60-day or greater, such as a 90-day comment period, is a critical time for students to provide feedback on the project, and we hope to see efforts from the university to educate students and inform them about opportunities on how they can get involved if they desire. But in the meantime, we encourage you to write any comments on the cards we have been distributing. When the, the EIR comment period comes, we intend to summarize this event and collectively draft a letter to submit and be presented. Therefore, please send any comments our way. And although our class on this event is getting closer to an end, we want to remind you that the housing crisis issue still pertains until better housing is built or enrollment is limited. This is surely a process that will extend far beyond what we were able to accomplish in this class, and we hope you all took this as an opportunity to feel inspired from the knowledge and wisdom we have acquired in just 10 weeks. So thank you, Professor Wright, for like, your abundant guidance. And this, with this, we call for safe, sustainable, accessible, and humane housing. Thank you. Aren't they amazing? We're a little early, actually, in our presentation. And so I would like to take a minute, because there were only so many students we could squeeze onto the stage. But we had a lot of students who couldn't present, but they were doing, we had three GIS specialists in our team who were helping us and giving guidance on figures. We had a couple who couldn't be here because they're on our division championship baseball team. And we, we had everyone working together in class. I would like the students who are not on stage to please stand up so you just know um, the class and who they are. And I will shame, shamelessly ask all of the urban designers and public agency managers and consultants who need some entry level planners and analysts or interns to contact me because they are here in this room and many of them would like a job. Okay, so um, I guess we're gonna do a little shift here and the group two will, um, some of you will stay and participate in the public comment period where they'll be taking notes. I invite the students from the earlier group who were um, also identified to do the note taking of public comments to come on stage. And of course, I'd like to have Jean join us um, on stage now if you'd like to. I'll just take a minute here to shift things around and wherever you like, Jean. Carve a space out for Jean.
Okay, so we have set up um, two mics that are right here in the main two aisles. And I will be calling out names and you're welcome to come up to the mics. If you haven't filled out a comment card that I have already been given, um, we have volunteers who can provide you a comment card and you can also come and um, join in. There are um, some organizations who, and also those who help sponsor this, that I'd like to first um, come up to speak. They will, because they are organizations, I'll give them between two and four minutes. Um, and I'm sorry, but I may have to be rude for some of you and cut you off. I give you a, a heads up that your time is nearing conclusion. Um, for individuals, we would like to give you up to two minutes to speak, okay? And once we get the organizations um, and I call the names of the commenters that I have, others can join in as well and, and get in line. Okay. I just have to set my timer here. All right, the first speaker I have is Elena Frazier from um, AIA Santa Barbara chapter. Is this, this is turned on, presumably. <laughs> it's hard to know which way to, to stand. Um, yes, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Elena Frazier. I'm a practicing architect here in Santa Barbara. And I am also the president of the American Institute of Architects Santa Barbara chapter. Um, I'm not an alum of UCSB, but I did grow up here in Santa Barbara, so this community is um, dear to my heart <laughs> and to my life. Um, quickly, I just want to commend the student presentations tonight. Um, super professional, really intriguing, um, really interesting. So great job all around. Um, it was really super interesting to hear your research. And a thank you to the organizers of tonight's event. I think as it's been stated before, an opportunity like this to have a dialogue about the project um, is really so important. So grateful for, for this opportunity. Um, our group, we, we like to start by emphasizing that AI Santa Barbara is um, most definitely in favor of more housing um, at UCSB and in our community, but not in the form that's currently proposed by <clears throat> the Munger Project. Um, as architects, it's our primary responsibility to design the built environment in a way that supports the health, safety, and welfare of not only the building occupants, but the community at large. And our chapter unequivocally believes that the Munger Residence Hall, as currently designed, um, does not meet these fundamental requirements. And our primary concern is the lack of windows and what we believe to be the inequitable and inhumane living conditions that would result um, from the windowless rooms. Uh, we expect these conditions to have immediate and long lasting psychological and physical health consequences for <clears throat> not only the building inhabitants, but the community at large. Windows from our, in our standpoint are a necessity, not uh, an optional luxury. It also, just to point out, came um, as a grave disappointment <laughs> to our group that the California Building Code um, does not support uh, or protect all building inhabitants from windowless rooms like the Munger Residence Hall. So while windows are required in healing rooms in hospitals or in juvenile hall detention rooms, um, they are not required in all sleeping rooms in all occupancies. And so our group is actively working right now to remedy that. We have a petition that's being reviewed by the California Building Standards Commission at this very moment um, to require windows in all sleeping rooms, in all occupancies um, throughout California. And um, I know my time is short, so I will conclude by saying that Munger Residence Hall is by no means the only solution to UCSB's housing crisis. I think that was well demonstrated um, tonight. And so I urge the university to seriously consider alternative designs. Thank you for your time.
Great, thank you very much. Um, could Nadia come up and speak? Nadia with SB Can, followed by Sarah Ahmed and Carly Wheeler of the Housing Justice Isla Vista group. Hi, good evening. My name is Nadia Abu Shanab. I am an alumna of UCSB and I'm on staff with SB Can Santa Barbara County Action Network. Uh, we're proud to be co-sponsoring this important event, and I'm so impressed by what we've seen today, the abundance of opportunities that are available for um, solutions to this housing problem. SB CAN is a lead organization in the Sun Sustainable University Now Coalition, which a decade ago, more than a decade ago, negotiated an agreement with UCSB on ways to mitigate the impacts of adding 5,000 new students by 2025 on the community. An important aspect of this agreement that was that UCSB pledged to house those 5,000 students on campus and to develop 18, 1,840 units of housing for faculty and staff, as we also heard in the presentation. SB CAN then endorsed the enrollment increase because of these pledges, and because these pledges would have helped ease the severe housing crisis in our region. Munger's proposed donation led the campus to put aside all other planning for the other projects and quote unquote, put all of their eggs into this one basket. And at the same time, the legislature has been pressuring UCSB and the other UCs to accelerate the growth of the student body. And UCSB reached that 25,000 enrollment um, cap at least seven years before they were meant to. Instead of helping ease the housing crisis, this Munger project, at least so far, has contributed to worsening it by delaying these other projects. We think that the UC's dependence on private financing and private development to provide affordable housing to students is one of the key reasons for this failure of the campus to fulfill the housing promise. Privatization is not a long-term strategy that will work, and it's time for the legislature and the regents to commit to major investments to enable affordable housing solutions that will benefit the campus community and the wider region, regardless of what happens with this Munger Hall project. There's a bill in the legislature currently called AB 1602 that would provide a revolving fund of $5 million to all of the different campuses. However, $5 million while it sounds like a lot is really not gonna be enough for these projects, Munger alone is $1.3 billion. So we really need to, as a campus and as a community, community, be putting pressure on our state government to figure out ways to find funding for these projects that doesn't have to rely on these donors who can um, decide whatever types of projects that they want without necessarily having enough community support and input. So thank you so much, and thank you to Deb and all of the students for hosting this event. Thank you. Sarah Ahmed and Carly Wheeler. Uh, hello, today uh, Carly and I are speaking out on behalf of Housing Justice Isla Vista, a community-based organization working to highlight the systemic housing crisis that plagues IV, as well as the, the history of community organizing and revolution that has resulted from this injustice. Based on a survey we sent out and a town hall meeting we helped host last week in collaboration with Eco Vista, students and community members have shared several accounts of unsanitary, unsafe, and unaffordable living conditions. From these statements, we drafted a set of community-based demands, and they are as follows. We recognize that all students, faculty, staff, and community members in Isla Vista deserve safe and affordable housing. According to a survey conducted of 52 Isla Vista residents and community members, 25.5% of respondents indicated that they do not know where they will be living in the next six months. 68.8% said it was very difficult for them to find housing. 66.7% do not think that their rent is fair for their current housing situation. 64% of respondents live with black mold in their current living situations, 64%. And there are up to 18 individuals being housed in a single unit in multiple areas of Isla Vista. We recognize that UCSB landlords and local government are responsible for leaving thousands of students, UCSB employees, and community members in unstable housing situations. 
We demand our local government to establish a rent cap in Isla Vista calculated based on the cost of living, not the market price, and this would be facilitated by the Community Services District. We demand the, to the hosting of a monthly town hall, also facilitated by the CSD, with our third district supervisor in attendance, as well as other Santa Barbara County officials, to consult the constituents of Isla Vista in policy making regarding residential zoning and housing laws. We demand our local government to encourage the use of existing buildings to house people who lack access to housing now, and to provide the CSO escorts with the capacity to provide car rides to students during usual patrol hours as part of efforts to safely assist community members forced to commute to and from campus in Isla Vista at late hours as a result of the lack of adequate housing, access to adequate housing in Isla Vista. And we also demand from UC Santa Barbara to support El Congreso's demands for a dorm planning committee with at least 25% student representation to provide a mandatory housing education and housing rights seminar for incoming UCSB students during orientation, to redirect funds toward developing unused space on campus into student housing, and to make UCSB an open campus to provide resources to all community members affected by UCSB's negligence. As local government and officials at UCSB, we need you to speak to the community members about establishing a rent cap you need to ask students and community members what we can afford that's not based on marketplace value. We need you to deeply consider what the basic necessities are for a safe and sanitary home and realize that students and community members do not live under these conditions. These horrible living conditions, including overcrowding, mold, and rent gouging, should not be normalized. They are unacceptable. And most importantly, you need to meet the basic basic housing needs of every Isla Vista community member at any point. Everyone should be housed when the space to live exists. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get Steve Gutman to come up here with Champ? Followed by, and I'll get into uh, individual speakers, uh, Richard Montes, Loomis, it looks like, or Lemus. <laughs> Hello, and uh, I wanted to echo what Lena said. A great job, everybody. And Jean, actually, thank you for, you know, showing the myths and the realities. I think I think this is all about sharing all the information so people can have informed reactions to the, the project. I, I think there are two things I want to say quickly. The UC uh, Office of the President is trying to address two primary issues. Uh, system-wide, affordability and sustainability. Um, from an affordability standpoint, the numbers that, that UC Office of the President has reported for the Munger Hall project, it would be one of the most expensive housing developments that UC ever has built. Um, so that, that's a, you know, I understand that, that maybe you're going to make it affordable for people to live there, but that doesn't mean it's affordable to build, and there are probably other ways to, to hit that affordability target, like using public-private partnerships with other campuses are doing. UC Berkeley is building uh, affordable housing through public-private partnerships. UC Santa Cruz is building them as well. Um, so that may be a way to find an alternate funding source and build more sustainable and humane housing. Um, you said it was a LEED Gold project, but I have to tell you that 47 LEED fellows, including myself, um, signed a petition or a letter, I'm sorry, saying that, that we did not feel that this project as proposed represents the highest uh, aspirations of sustainability of the LEED rating system. Um, and having spent a fair amount of time studying daylight and views um, for LEED certification systems, um, I helped author the LEED for healthcare rating system. I can tell you that daylight and views is, is a human right. It is not an optional thing, as Elena said. Um, the European Union, has, European Union has recognized it as a human right, and I would say that 90% that of bedrooms without daylight and views is a problem. Thank you, Steve. Richard Montes Limus. Hello, my name is Richard and I am a third year environmental studies major. And after touring the Munger Hall mock-up, speaking to project leaders there, 
and attending a Congreso demand meeting where we discussed this issue with the chancellor and other administration members, myself and my organization have come to the overwhelming conclusion that Munger Hall is an inadequate attempt for the university to address our housing crisis. Clearly, there is a plethora of issues and concerns surrounding Munger Hall. But to keep it short, I will limit it to those involving self-reliance, ownership, and exploitation of building code standards. First, it hinders student community resilience because it is not a self-reliant building. It is a building fully dependent on 24-7 artificial ventilation and lighting. It's not a sustainable building, which according to the History of Art and Architecture Department of UCSB, refers to passive strategies to reduce energy consumption, like considering sun orientation when sitting or being thoughtful about window placement. It refers to using renewable energy sources like solar and wind power and low environmental impact building materials. Munger Hall ignores the natural resources we have available. It works against them rather than with them. In terms of its exploitation of building codes, it exploits a loophole in California's building standards, which allow alternative methods of compliance to use mechanical windows and ventilation to replace real windows. Simply because a building code is met does not make it right. Minimum requirements are arbitrary, and the quality of students' lives should be their priority, not checking off a box. Finally, following through with the Munger Hall project would deprive student communities of ownership. Munger has made it clear that his plans must be followed thoroughly. Major changes would cause him to pull funding. Here, we see the privatization of public spaces, our spaces. It makes no sense to allow one man to have so much power to dictate the living conditions of thousands of students for generations to come. I'm glad to see so many students come together today to address this issue and hope the voices of those most directly impacted are prioritized. Thank you. Thank you. Luna Moreno, followed by Alexander Luckman. Hello everyone, my name is Luna Moreno and I'm here tonight on behalf of El Congreso de UCSB, which is an organization that has recently issued demands against UC administration in regards to Munger Hall. In our list of demands, ultimately we demanded the end of the Munger Hall residence plan. Beyond administration's lack of transparency when it comes to the Munger Hall plan, we continue to uncover more facts about the project that are unsettling, unacceptable, and inhumane. Essentially, the mock-up tour was unconvincing. In a single mock-up house, one of our members highlighted how disoriented they felt. The long corridors, lack of windows, and mechanical ventilation all contributed to this feeling. At the massive scale of this project, which is eight houses per floor for nine floors, it's probable that a large percentage of those who will live in Munger Hall will constantly feel a similar or comparably worse disorientation. Furthermore, in the case of an emergency, up to nearly 5,000 students evacuating the building at once would be extremely dangerous and difficult to organize due to the lack of spatial awareness that's caused by windowless corridors in an astronomically large building. Additionally, the tours are misleading as they don't provide the proper perspective of how long the corridors that lead to the common rooms really are. Based on the schematics, some of the corridors would be as long as a football field. These isolated corridors, in many instances with little to no natural light, are extremely concerning, suffocating, and disorienting. Any positive feedback that is being received by the tours is based on misinformation and a lack of understanding of the entire scope of the project. This, quite understandably, is not displayed in the tour, but it shouldn't be completely ignored by the presenters who are trying to frame this project in a positive light. Thank you.
Alexander Lechman, followed by Ben Jamison Ellsmore. Hi, uh, my name is Alexander Lechman. I'm a PhD student in architectural history here at UC Santa Barbara. Tonight, I just wanted to pick up one thread, uh, Charlie Munger's description of Munger Hall as, quote, our version of ship architecture on land. This description is far more apt than Mr. Munger would like. The LED panels that replace windows in most bedrooms are modeled on Disney cruise ships. And the rooftop leisure plaza nicknamed Our Town in the Sky reminds one of a cruise ship's top deck. All that's missing is a water slide. Like a cruise ship in the ocean, the gargantuan building bills itself as a self-contained community that bears little, if any, relation to its surroundings. The whole idea is that students will be thrown together in Munger Hall's communal spaces, rather than going to the library, cafeterias, green spaces, the beach, or engaging in any of the other ways of being and learning that currently exist on campus. Under the pretense of corporate campus-style social spaces, this artificial conviviality actually rejects the curiosity and choice that underpin what a liberal education can and should be. Munger Hall is a ship, all right. The only problem is that it's the Titanic. Tonight's student presentations provide a much needed life raft. Thank you. Ben. Jameson Ellsmore, followed by what I have as our last speaker, Kenneth David Garcia Rojas. If there are others who want to um, comment, you can line up um, after Kenneth. Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Jameson Ellsmore. I'm a doctoral candidate in history of art and architecture at uh, UCSB here. So we set the tone tonight as one of respectful civil discourse. The student-led plan is the embodiment of respect and sensitivity to local context. On the other hand, parachuting in a monolithic silver bullet like Munger Hall does not share in this respect. I just wanna point out that the student-led plan doesn't have to fall back on marketing language like convivial kitchens and amenities. Instead, you demonstrated your knowledge of the legal and physical landscape at UCSB. Your plan is the embodiment of respect, and those who would push their ego projects on UCSB should learn from your example. The presentation of information on Munger Hall tonight might have been respectful in tone, but its, its design is anything but respectful, relying instead on a brute force approach to the problem. The student-led plan, on the other hand, is respectful in presentation and in design, so thank you. I was just given a, a handful of speaker slips, so I'm glad that this is continuing on. We have Kenneth David Garcia Rojas, followed by Sarah Hamadi. Hello, I'm Kenneth David Garcia Rojas, and I'm speaking on behalf of El Congreso here at UCSB. It is our duty as students to give honest evaluations on school policies and projects, and Munger Hall is without a doubt subject to such evaluations. I will begin with addressing the fact that Munger Hall's design is firmly attached to the prefabricated seven by 10 foot RC modules. For at least six years, the designs for Munger Hall, which address the housing crisis, have gone through review and criticism, and yet, the plans have not been changed. The question is why? What is so essential of these modules, of the efficient designs, which forces a highly dense structure and is the true reason why 94% of students will not have a window? Charles Munger's expert design seems to be absent, absent of architectural knowledge, and the truth is he has no background in such areas. Why has the university been forced into sticking with this design for so long? Because Charles Munger is unwilling to let go of this design, UCSB has had to amend the LRDP, meaning the building as it is does not fit standards. But because no one with the power to change its structure will do so, the school is forced to find ways to meet the LRDP requirements in a somewhat faulty manner. So, why is this building allowed to flout the goals of the LRDP? More so, why should a donor be allowed to change the LRDP? 
Why is money being favored over sustainability and safe solutions to the housing crisis? The university is being made to look weak at the hands of money, weak at the hands of a billionaire. Finally, the building, if fully proceeded with, without some form of compromise, through change designs, will eventually meet crisis. Charles, as the chief designer with no architectural background, I hope you take the same ownership when things go wrong, when a firestorm or a rainstorm takes place. These are bound to happen. We live in California, especially in Santa Barbara. Will you be responsible and take the blame for the damage to students in campus? When this happens, students will be trapped in a building and they cannot open a window, not for air or for the means to be aware of their surroundings. So please reconsider your design. Remember, generous giving should be done with the intention of what's best for the recipients, not to make yourself look good. We need housing, but pragmatic and safe housing. We do not need an all-in-one rushed and dangerous design. The best things that are done are done right. So do this correctly. It will help everyone else in the long term. Thank you. Sarah, Sarah Hamidi, followed by Zoe Anthanasia. Sorry if I got your name wrong, Zoe. Hi, guys. I'm sorry, I'm a bit nervous, but um, my name is Sarah Hamidi. I'm a fifth year anthropology major, and I'm also a soon to be UCSB alumni. I'm graduating in two weeks. And unfortunately, this UCSB has been the worst experience of my life. You know who you're talking to as well? One of your students who almost faced homelessness. Let me repeat, homelessness. I had to live in a hotel in a single room. If I was extremely depressed in that single hotel room, what makes you think I'm gonna be happy living in Munger Hall? I saw your mock-up. It sucks. Excuse me to say that. It sucks. It looks like a prison. It looks like a jail cell. It looks like I'm being punished and tarnished to hell. It's horrible. Why can't you listen to your students? Every time there's been a problem, COVID, housing, sexual assault, increase in crime, your students have been brave enough all of these people here are being extremely brave and courageous to come to you guys and say, we need help. This is what we can do. And time and time again, you think you know better than us and you keep ignoring us and I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it, I'm tired. Oh, and by the way, it was $200 million. Chris Hayes reported on it. He's one of the best journalists in the business. And for you to insinuate he's lying, as an aspiring journalist, I'm insulted. Because we work our butts off to make sure these people have the right information. And have you not learned anything about the fact that misinformation is a threat to this country and you are spreading it? You are spreading misinformation. That's wrong. And Munger Hall is wrong. Since when have you prioritized money over morals? Since when do you prefer to kiss ass to a millionaire and not listen to your students? Okay. So, Sarah, you have your two minutes are up. Uh, so, thank you for not giving a crap about students. And for one, I will never come back to UCSB. And I hope you do better. That's all I can say. And Henry Yang needs to resign. I'm sorry. Okay, our next speaker is Zoe Athanasia. Athanasia. Um, I would like to say, I know this is an emotional topic. I have not been in, living in the shoes of students who've been homeless. Um, I can't, you know, say I understand, but I know this is an emotional, very emotional discussion. I would ask 
that you recognize that there are people here who are individuals who represent the bigger institution and that you um, do provide everyone who's talking in our forum with respect. Thank you. Zoe? Um, first, I want to start off with, I didn't plan on speaking today. I pulled out my little detective pad while they were speaking and just felt that passion. And it made me think of all of you. I just want to say thank you to the people that showed up um, because that shows you care. And if you care, that means you're going to protect this institution, which is the most important thing. Um, what I want to speak about is what do you think of when you think of UCS UCSB? The mountains, the ocean, what about the fact that we're the founders of Earth Day? That's pretty cool. Or the fact that, yeah, the fact that we have Nobel Prize winners walking on this campus. And yet this, Munger Hall is the best that they could have thought of. Munger Hall, as shown, does not stand with the integrity of UCSB's values or even its standards. It blocks these views and it's reckless not only with the environment, but with its students. There are several red flags, as we have seen, but one that stuck out to me was the emphasis of the 20% off uh, rate for students. First, let's break that down a little bit. If students don't have a car, where are they going to buy this food that's going to make it lower cost? Well, the market upstairs. Any of us who walk through um, into the Arbor know how expensive UCSB food is. It is not going to be cheaper. If you're paying you know, practically $6 for an apple and a water, Hmm, that's going to cause some issues there, which made me think, who's going to suffer the most? Oh, the lower income students, the ones who are going to look at that price tag and think, oh, this is a better deal than Isla Vista. And now they're stuck in a windowless dorm paying for food that they thought was going to be cheaper. No, that's not protecting your students. On top of that, don't get me wrong that I understand the need for this housing. I was homeless for two quarters. Even now, I commute two and a half hours to three hours to school each week. Because of this, I lost my spot on the Division I track team, thanks to UCSB. So don't, don't get me wrong, I not only feel the stress of the housing, but I felt the heartbreak too. That experience is not what I expected from UCSB. I expected dreams to be made, not taken away. This, and this solution is not what I expected from our leaders either. No matter how they spin it, Munger Hall is insufficient, insensitive, and incredibly thoughtless to the foundation of US, UCSB's upstandingness. So, to finish this off, and instead of just being angry and hurt that UCSB has allowed this to happen to many students, I beg they simply stop. Stop the over-enrolling. Seems simple. Or, on top of that, how about you start decreasing enrollment to make sure that every student has a bed? Did you ever think of that? I'm just saying, take care of your students while cleaning up the mess that you have made. And on top of that, you have students that care. We've been here to support, to give answers. There was exceptional solutions provided today. If the UCSB Leaders would just be willing to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Dennis Whalen, followed by Sarah. Um, Sarah, you did you? You already uh, spoke, right? Followed by Sharon Z. Terry. So Dennis Whalen, followed by Sharon Z. Terry. Hello, my name is Dennis Whalen. I was the associate campus architect here at UCSB, now retired, as well as a UCSB graduate. I appreciate the students' uh, points of view. Uh, Professor Bright, Ms. Callahan, your involvement in this, because it brings out a most uh, glaring omission. Uh, there was no building committee for this project, which typically would include students. There was no architect selection, which would have included students. There was no design review committee, which includes student representatives. After 30 years on staff, 
in campus planning and design, I have to confess to be just a bit jaded as to the much touted shared governance principle. Uh, because this project has been going on for at least 10 years. in virtual secrecy with just the chancellor and Mr. Munger holding the pencil. In the decade that's passed, housing facilities could have been built, constructed, occupied, but now the university is in violation of its agreement made with the LRDP and has been named in a lawsuit by the city of Goleta to that effect. The project continues to be defended against the observation of seven past UC campus architects the local chapter of the American Institute of Architect, the New York Times architecture critic, along with national and worldwide outlet, as well as being a low value question on Jeopardy. <laughs> this is the most expensive project on ca the campus has ever seen, more than eight times the cost of San Joaquin housing at this point, and designed by a person with no professional training or licensure. If Professor Lucas cares to respond, my only question is why? Why Mr. Munger? Why the secrecy? And why not hire qualified design professionals and follow campus pro protocol for new buildings? Thank you. Thank you. I have Sharon Z. Terry and Andy Barretta Real. Hi, I never talk at anything like, can you hear me? I never talk at anything like this, so if I sound a little goofy, I apologize. Um, I'm a local community member. I live in Goleta, lived in Goleta over 30 years, and I'm also a retired UCSB staff member as of June 2020, retiring into COVID. Such fun. Well, I wanted to thank everybody, Professor Lucas, the students. This was, this was incredible. Um, what I thought, uh, the student ideas, adding more to the San Inez footprint, El Dorado and uh, Westgate, the East Campus residence halls, I think that's, to me, that's much superior to Munger Hall. I'm concerned as, a, as a, someone who does come through campus from time to time, there's only three ways to get into campus, 217, El Colegio and Mesa Road. If you've got a residence hall that's bigger than Dos Pueblos High School and San Marcos High School combined. Logistically, I think that, that that's, that's an issue for those of us in the community and people do use Mesa Road for other things. If you've ever been by Dos Pueblos High School or San Marcos High School, when the students stream out of there, it's crazy. Logistically, it's crazy. I'm also concerned about many of the issues that have been mentioned before, but uh, I really hope I really hope you can find an alternative to Munger Hall. I think that would be better for everybody in the community as well as the students. Thank you all for everything you've done though. I know there's been a lot of work on all sides. Thank you. Andy, followed by Zach Sheriff, Sharif. Hello. All right. Thank you. It's honestly like much scarier being here than like sitting all the way in the back. So <laughs> sorry if I get a little nervous. But um, pretty much, um, I think that what everybody was saying is like uh, valid. I think like, the points of like a uh, windowless uh, uh, dorm, I think, is something I don't want to reiterate. Um, I, I'm kind of wanting to uh, bring a different perspective uh, that I just recently heard about, and I'm still trying to like get uh, understand the concept. But I just kind of like wanted to share y'all um, and kind of like uh, let y'all you know um, make your own opinion of it. But uh, yeah, but my name is uh, Annie Barrera Rios. Uh, I'm one of the care pre-educators from the care office. Um, essentially, uh, it's the office here on campus that provides advocacy, uh, advocacy and resources for students affected by sexual assault, domestic violence on campus. And uh, even though I work for the office as a care, as a student worker, I just want to say I'm not representing the care office. I just want to talk from my personal opinion. But I wanted to bring in my position because this has to do with what I wanted to talk about, right? Um, and so in this position, I talk to students on how gaining power and control over people is a root cause of, of, perpetrate, of perpetrating sexual assault. And I wanted to connect it to this new concept of sexual geography that refers to the idea of how the power to control spaces we occupy can be used to perpetuate sexual assault. 
Munger's Hall's tiny room, oh wait, let me repeat that one more time. Munger's Hall's tiny room robs students the majority of their personal space, therefore their power to control their privacy and their own, and own boundaries, they set with people visiting their own residence. For example, let's say a Munger Hall resident brings a friend over to the room and they are just interested in getting to know them, right? Nothing romantic, but just trying to get to know that person. The resident doesn't want to sit in the desk chair to not make it awkward, um, and so they decide to sit next to their friend in the bed. Because of the, because of dominant hookup culture, some people would derive the, res the resident sitting next to them in bed as an invitation to having sex. But that's not true, because literally the only, space, the only spaces they have to sit is a desk and a bed. I'm not against building uh, housing. I also was, uh, um, did not have a secure housing, and I almost got scanned by a landlord who wanted to charge me like a whole year of like rent. Um, and like when you're in desperation, like you really do consider like coughing up like 10,000 grand just to like, like be here and live on campus. Uh, fortunately, I figured it out. But I'm not against building housing, but I am against giving uh, an almost unlivable personal space that looks like a renovated jail for students to live in. Uh, by building Munger Hall, the university will further perpetrate interpersonal violence on campus, and I don't need to say that, UCSB, that the UCSB community has had enough instances of sexual assault uh, happen this year. Um, and I think that we cannot give up the safety and quality of life of our students for a cheap answer to the housing crisis. I think we're all capable of being better, and I think just this event and just us talking about what we could do to, uh, like, to find an alternate uh, like answer to this crisis is like an uh, example of how we could all do better. And so, thank you. Zach, Zach Sharif, are you still? Oh. Followed by Joshua Richardson. Name is Zachary Atanas Dimitro Sharev, and I condemn Munger Hall. However, just as we remain skeptical when we see Munger Hall and question its humanity, Humanity, we also must remain skeptical on proposed solutions. So that is why I come with a question. So, how did presenters arrive at the conclusion that East Side residence halls need no new dining commons? Because I, as a resident in Santa Bar and Santa Rosa, have experienced how busy DLG gets, and I'm concerned that. If there's no new dining hall, then how will this issue be resolved? I'd like, to, I'd like to clarify that this is a public comment period where we will take your question mm -hmm. and we will consider it, but this is not an interactive question answer forum. Okay. So please go ahead and ask your questions. We will take them down and note them. All right. And, we will, and we will think about them. Okay. Uh, that's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have Joshua Richardson, followed by um, Jesse Casey, and I, that's the last speaker slip I have unless our volunteers have more. This is very tiny. Um, yeah, so uh, from what I've been hearing a lot tonight, um, from what was shared from the ES-135B students, um, and also just my own personal understanding of the history of development here, is that it sounds like there are a lot of promises going around. Um, that the LRDP promised to develop under specific guidelines, that we promised to limit enrollment to UCSB, um, but we've broken our promise to limit the growth of enrollment and continue to edit and defy the LRDP to move forward and continue breaking further promises. Um, you then uh, try to sit here and guarantee me that it's safe and significant and that LED screens seem to work, um, but it, from what I've been hearing a lot tonight and just in my personal experience, modernist house, Hogwarts houses don't really work um, and, and this just isn't sufficient. Um, but I feel like a lot, like we can't accept these promises and guarantees anymore um, because we still have things like this going. Um, and it creates so many more other questions within myself and um, just in a lot of people of how do you plan to keep these promises when you continue to have more changes to make? That you even mentioned that the MTD will create new access routes. Um, but what does that look like? What does traffic in this area look like when we just had an accident 
less than a mile away from here, not even a week ago. Um, it's time to stop bending the rules and accept what works. You've just been given real solutions from this amazing course um, that seem to work as well, if not better, than what you were given by some rich billionaire. And I'm not even entirely sure that I can trust you anymore to promise to review these truthfully and with open minds. Um, lastly, beyond just commenting in the fact that this is a public comment, please don't stop, stop talking about this. Many of us individuals here are graduating soon, within this quarter, the next few months, whatever that is. Um, please don't forget that this is the second to last opportunity that will really exist to begin talking about these, to have this entire conversation here. Spread the word and spread the information that students and members of our community have already found alternatives and don't let them forget that it's up to them to hear us and remember that we can't take these promises anymore and we shouldn't have to. Thank you. Okay, the last speaker slip I have is for Jesse Casey. Anyone else want to speak? Please come up to one of the microphones. Um, hi, my name is Jesse Casey. I'm a student here at UCSB. Um, I don't think anyone's talked about this yet, but Munger Hall is only actually paying for 13% of the project, which I think is a big deal. I mean, it'd be like if all of your you know, housemates went out to get a Costco pizza, and then one of your housemates said, you know what, actually you can't have sauce and you can't have cheese, but we're still getting the pizza anyway. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, also, one thing that really irked me about Munger Hall is uh, he was talking about how it was uh, designed, or it was partially inspired by Le Corbusier. I, I de definitely said that wrong. Uh, he's a French architect who um, helped push the modernist movement forward. Um, he built the Unité de Habitation Modernist Housing Project in Marseille. Um, and it's concerning because Munger Hall, who has no architectural experience, um, said that he uh, took the whole thing because it didn't work worth shit. Oh, sorry, excuse my language. Um, and he told the architectural record writer, Fred Bernstein, I fixed that. And we took Corbusier's errors. By the way, Corbusier has 17 World Heritage sites of his architecture in the United Nations. Um, and he said, Munger said, I fixed that. And we took Corbusier's errors and the errors in university housing and eliminated them one by one. I think it's really concerning that one of the lead architects of the project has that much disrespect for one of the leading architects in the, United, you know, the world community. Um, I also wanted to say that we are experiencing a housing crisis. You know, I've been not able to move out of my house because if I do, my rent will probably increase by upwards of $600 a month. Um, so I've been staying in the same place for about four years now. Um, and I think it's important to realize that even though we are in a crisis, that we need to make sure that we don't choose the wrong solutions when we're desperate and that we wait for the correct solutions that we know are gonna help us into the future. Thank you. Do we have any more comments? Any more public comments? Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. You're good. Um, my name is Karina Mendez. I'm here as a member of El Congreso and as a general member of the student body. As my peers have mentioned, this housing plan lacks transparency, architectural soundness, and most importantly, ethicality. Not only would this housing plan inevitably result in extreme mental health complications, it would only provide students with the absolute bare minimum space that is not suitable for personalization or comfort. These spaces are so compact that it is virtually impossible to make any rearrangements of the space. It is crucial that a living space is one that can be personalized and modified to one's comfort. Without this possibility, the university is not providing students with a sanctuary, but rather a confine. In our meeting with administration, we posed the question if anyone believes the Munger Hall housing plan is ethical. We were met with silence. Nobody believes that Munger Hall is ethical, as we gather in a lecture hall filled with desperate and concerned individuals to discuss this matter. $200 million, $1 billion, it doesn't matter how much money is being donated, how much financial burden is being alleviated, this housing plan is unethical and the university should not be swayed. We need humane housing and Munger Hall fails to meet that standard. Thank you. Okay, and I have uh, Yoli Cohen. Hello, um, I just have a lot of concerns about the logistics of how Munger Hall would even work. 
Um, in terms of the kitchen that's designed to be for all of the, like so many students on one floor sharing one communal kitchen, if these are students that are meant to be making their own meals, um, given that they'll have a marketplace above them, I really don't really, I don't really understand how all of these students are going to be expected to use um, one kitchen for each floor to cook all their meals. It doesn't really seem like that would work. And then also, um, given the transportation, you did say that there would be a bus line um, that would connect Munger Hall. Um, however, given already like the bus crisis that's happening right now, even just driving past um, Santa Catalina in the mornings, I'll see lines and lines of people like waiting for the bus at Santa Catalina. So it seems like there's already so many problems with the transportation system the way it is. And I don't um, know how Munger Hall being so far away and really requiring um, bus access, especially for students that might have um, limited mobility. Um, I really don't see how that would work. And it seems like there would be a lot more problems caused with that. So while well, I do think that um, I think in Munger Hall has been touted as the solution to all of our problems in terms of housing, but I really do think that Munger Hall will cause more problems than it solves. So thank you. If anyone else would like to speak, please fill out a speaker slip. You may speak. Will you fill out a speaker slip yeah, too? Great. Yeah, I will. Great, thank you. Okay, my name is Martin Henderson. And I've been uh, a long range resident for the last 40 years. And um, well, I mean, I think this is great. Uh, we're meeting here. We have public uh, forum on this uh, important uh, campus project. And we're all able to say what we think. And um, it's great to see Dr. Lucas here. Last time I saw you was in 2009 over at Santa Catalina. And we were having a meeting about an important, about all the projects, about the long range development plan. And the last thing I remember you saying at the end of the meeting was, quote, we've gotten a lot of comments on Ocean Road. Remember that? So soon after that, the project was dropped, okay? Same project, same project that the um, regents passed the other day. But the problem is, is that the project was dropped. Then it was brought back like four years ago. We've had no meetings. We've had no debate. We've had no discussion. But all of a sudden, this thing has been approved. One of the things they're going to do in this project is, uh, demolish the student health clinic. And I, I guess they're gonna let go all the workers, all the, all the health professionals who work there. That's your clinic. That's number one on the, on the list. There's no guarantee that they're gonna replace it at any point. They're talking about, oh yeah, maybe we, we might build another one somewhere else, but no plan for that, no financing for that. Also, this thing is financed by basically taking the land and giving it to private developers for their profit. They're gonna build it, they're gonna charge what they wanna charge. But I didn't really wanna get into all this, not to mention the eucalyptus trees, which, by the way, guys, is an environmentally sensitive habitat area. This is a National Marine Wildlife Reserve out on this coast, okay? Migratory birds come around this peninsula. Guess where they land? Eucalyptus curtain, not to mention the monarch butterflies. That species of monarch, that species of eucalyptus trees are symbiotic with the monarch butterflies. In fact, I'll give you a little history. Could you, could in, in the you last hundred up? years, the rise of the monarch butterfly population coincides with the rise of the, migra the, the migration. Same thing with the decline of the eucalyptus trees have coincided with the decline of, of the migration. Okay, I, I, I'll wrap it up. Thank you. Um, my point is, is that 
we need discussion. We need to talk about this Ocean Road project. We really do. So I have to say thank you. Yes. Hi. <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry. I did fill out a comment card, but I didn't check the little box. But <clears throat> excuse me. I wanted to come up here and verbalize my comments. My name is Selena Evil Sizer Whitney. I'm a planner with um, Santa Barbara County, currently working on the county's housing element update. <clears throat> excuse me. And I just wanted to verbally express my gratitude. <clears throat> Gosh, sorry. <clears throat> uh, it's allergies. <laughs> um, my sincere gratitude and appreciation um, for all of the hard work that you clearly put into this, not, you know, over the past 10 weeks and tonight, um, and the clear, in, you know, intention and research and presenting your recommendations in a way that I can, I will pick up and take to the rest of the housing element team um, and push forward on recommendations where um, the county as an entity can work to provide more, encourage and facilitate more housing through our housing element update. Um, we are in the midst of that update, so please, shameless plug, please go to the county's um, planning and development department website or see the board outside. Take our survey that's going on now. We need as much input as we can get from everyone in the unincorporated county areas and um, we will have a lot more outreach going on this summer and fall and through the winter. Um, so please express um, all of your ideas and opinions. <laughs> and thank you very much again. This has been very helpful and informative. Thank you, Selena. Eric, go ahead. You have three, I'm giving everyone three minutes, so you have three minutes. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Eric Magana. I am here also on behalf of El Congreso. I was watching the live stream and I ran over, because I was like, I need to speak. <laughs> um, so, as some of my peers have mentioned before, we did issue demands to administration, UCSB administration. Um, so just to reiterate um, some of the responses from them, which were nothing, by the way. Um, when we asked them why hasn't the university properly addressed the public and student dissatisfaction regarding Munger Hall, there was deafening silence. When we asked the administrators why Munger Hall continues to be prioritized and pursued even after being met with widespread criticism and downright outrage from students, faculty, staff, and expert architects working on the plan, the silence continued. When we asked the administrators why a different housing project could not be prioritized, especially one that would not require the creation of an independent review panel and the construction of a $2 million mock-up to convince people of its viability, the silence continued. So the work that y'all have put in today to kind of show, you know, what they could have done to communicate that is really impressive. So I think, you know, your class for doing that. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's just really telling that like they couldn't answer these questions um, after so many years of sitting on this plan in some way. Um, so some of the things that also concerned us as El Congreso, um, the question of being not forced to live here, um, Professor Jean Lucas mentioned that people will not be forced to live here. However, naturally by increasing the bed count in campus housing by approximately 4,500, which is a considerable expansion of available housing, there will inevitably be students living in Munger Hall who had no other choice. Furthermore, with how Munger Hall is being sold, through the description of its amenities and resources, even now through the public tours of the mock-up, many students will be misled into what Munger Hall is truly like. So that is something you, that needs to be considered that people will be, and on top of being forced because they're going through campus housing and there's no other options, they may also be misled into thinking this is so great and then they live there and they're like, oh my God. Um, additionally, um, for the virtual windows, it's an erroneous and false term for what is effectively a light panel that changes color. Um, a virtual window insinuates that there's gonna be like scenery or something, yeah, it's, it's a panel of light. Um, and finally, I will mention the risk of surveillance, something that I don't think has been brought up today at all. Um, so there is no guarantee that the opportunity to surveil students will not be taken advantage of. Currently, very few to little areas in campus housing have cameras surveilling the space. However, with Munger Hall being a fully indoor community, 
there is a likelihood of the corridors and common areas being set up with cameras due to the size of the building. Additionally, in the current plan, the building is next to the UC Police Department station, which would contribute to an environment where students may feel surveilled and uncomfortable. So as a person of color, that is something that immediately concerns me personally. It is something that as El Congreso, it concerns us very much as a community of students advocating for students of color. So that's also something to consider for any admin listening. So thank you. Okay, they keep rolling in. Let's see. Um, Martha Henderson, I'm sorry, I can't read the last. Oh, okay, thank you. Just a comment card for someone who spoke. Uh, question was, do we let people uh, comment twice? I'm unfortunately, um, then we need to reopen the whole public hearing for everyone to, to, uh, to talk twice. But please fill out the comment cards. Um, so if you have more ideas, suggestions, comments, please fill those out. Um, we will, they're, they're valuable and we will take those and we will forward them on. What we're intending to do is assemble both the public verbal comments and the written comments and submit them to CHAMP as public comments for inclusion during the public comment period of the draft EIR. One of the key things to note about a draft EIR is a minimum comment period is 45 days. When a project has public controversy, it's often um, expanded to 60 days, but it can be expanded more than that. And depending on the time that the uh, draft EIR is released, there should be consideration of extending that time to allow for that overlap for our biggest stakeholders, the students, to comment. So that's something that can be requested um, regarding the public comment period. That's an important opportunity for you all to chime in again after you get to review the environmental impact report. Okay. I believe that that's the end of our comments. And um, I will close the public comment time and turn this back over to Deb Callahan. Thank you very much. I'm almost speechless, um, which I shouldn't be because I'm at a mic right now. And I want to say um, thank you profoundly for um, a really powerful almost three hours. Um, I've personally learned so much and more than that, I've felt a lot. Um, I hear you and uh, I'll leave with knowledge and an emotional imprint hearing about students' homelessness, you read about it, but when you see someone testify about their living experience, it is profound. So I thank you for those of you who had the courage to stand up here today and really put yourself out there. I hear you. Um, and I think we all hear you. And I, something I wanna share with you is somebody I, who's professionally involved in um, the democratic process and public policy and politics and environmental advocacy is I believe strongly that um, debate and disagreement and conversation and learning is the music of democracy. And I think that all of us together in this room have demonstrated that together, that we can hear each other and respect one another and be real and make things happen together that are good for ourselves, good for our communities and good for the world. After all, isn't that why you have just spent all this time at the university as so many of you are about to go out there and really make good on that promise of making this world, your communities, your families, and your lives better than they were. Um, so I'm proud of all of you because obviously you are amazing people who are about to go out there and, and do great things in the world. You're also continuing to work to do things good here, even though not a single one of you, I don't believe, would ever actually live in Munger Hall, most likely. And that's remarkable. 
Something else I want to say is for those of you who are graduating and moving on now, and some of you who I've gotten to know in this class are, and I will miss you very much having gotten to know you quickly and really come to really enjoy you and respect you. But for those of you who are moving on, don't leave, don't leave the Munger Hall issue behind. And one way you can stay engaged, a little plug here, is uh, to join CHAMP. Because after all, we are a student and alumni organization. And there's something that I'm gonna stand here and represent that I wanna say to all of you, is there are thousands upon thousands of UCSB alumni who, no matter how long we've been away from this place, have a genuine emotional tie to this university. And by extension, we want to see you students succeed and we want to see this university succeed, as I know the faculty do, as I know the staff do. Um, and we have to find a way. This conversation today kind of helps show us a way of conversation and information and learning. And it took every, every aspect of stakeholders here, um, at the administration and the Munger Hall planners, students, alumni, community organizations, professional organizations. Um, I know that members of the media have been here and I know that representatives of government and elected officials have been here or have been watching online. So we're here and that's important. We need to keep going, find a way, don't leave it behind. I graduated in 81 and I'm standing here trying to do something about this um, housing problem that you all face. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time to the amazing ES-135B class. You all rocked the house. I think we all agree that the thought and the time that you put in really was remarkable. Uh, and, and to Professor Reader Bright, I think you're a pretty courageous professor because you know you you like this is not what you signed up for was to not only teach your class and do your day job but then to work together to put on this. Um, and I and I want to say to Jean Lucas and to the other UCSB um, administration staff and Munger Hall planners that are here, thank you for coming and for spending your evening and for you know listening to what we have to say. Um, we look forward to working together to finding good housing solutions. We won't always agree on things, but we are going to find a way forward, and I have faith in that. Um, so um, let's keep going, and thank you so very much um, for making this evening possible. Um, there's one thing I do also want to say is um, we had um, a good audience on our stream, but also some other individuals um, had trouble getting into the live stream. So for those people who were interested in this evening and were not able to plug into the live stream, uh, if you know of anyone who wanted to watch this, there's a, a good recording um, of the entire evening. So if any of you want to get a recording of this evening, um, contact CHAMP, and we will make sure that you get a recording of this evening for whatever purposes that you might want one, and we'll be happy to provide it. Um, remember out in the hall to drop your comment cards. Um, we're gonna make sure that your comments um, on cards and verbally uh, continue to be shared out with decision makers. Um, sign up for CHAMP, get engaged in community organizations that are working on this important issue. Um, so to all of you today who've come, who've participated, who've shared, and are committed to making student housing at UCSB not a source of stress, not a source of unhappiness or, you know, deep personal um, distress. Let's fix that. This should be a joyful experience, not um, an experience where you're feeling um, like the home where you live is not a place that's really a home for you, or if you're displaced, which is even worse. Let's make sure there's enough housing here for everyone who needs it, and that it is affordable, that it is sustainable, and it is appropriate student housing. Thank you all so much for being here tonight.